Hi everyone, Lee Diffie with you here from Miller Motorsports Park just outside Salt Lake City in Utah. Championship day in the Rolex Sports Car Series. We will return you to the truck race in just a moment, but we want to bring you up to date with what's happening on this all-important day in the Rolex Series. Both championships being decided. Plenty of action. Colin Brown and Jan Magnussen getting together. And the car that Magnussen is in, the SunTrust machine, is a championship contending car. We bring you back to live action here, though, and the race for the championship and this motor race. John Fogarty leading Salvador Duran, and the pressure is on. A telling moment, though, a short while ago, there was a full course caution, just the second one in this race, and the 99 did not pit. The 01 Ganassi car did. That could be a defining moment in this motor race and the championship. So much more to come. We've been running for three and three quarter hours, and we will see you at the conclusion of the truck race. Enjoy the afternoon on speed. We are back at Miller Motorsports Park here in Utah, just outside of Salt Lake City for championship day in the Rolex Sports Car Series, the 14th and final round. Coming into this race today, this car, the 99 Gaines Co. Auto Insurance, Pontiac Riley, Bob Stallings team lead the way by one championship point. However, dramatic scenes here while we've been away and congratulations incidentally to Ron Hornaday, first repeat winner at Loudoun, New Hampshire because the pressure really is on these guys. Lee Diffie along with Dorsey Schrader, Calvin Fish, Brian Till and Chris Neville. This is an interesting one strategically. It really was. The caution flew and the 99 car weathered through. It was a miscommunication or making a strategy call, decided to keep John Fogarty out on the racetrack. Meanwhile, the rest of the leaders pitted. They got topped up with fuel. So now we're in a position in terms of the 99 car has to gap these guys by about 15 to 20 seconds by my calculations. We expect everyone to make two trips down pit row to get fuel before the end of this race. But for the 01 and the 10 car, that second start will be for a splash of fuel. The 99 car will need a lot more fuel than that. So really, the pressure is finally on those gains, go boys. And this is surely a miscommunication because there's no way they made the error not to realize that this was going to happen. What probably happened was that they were getting close to the pit-in area. And then at that point in time, John Fogarty got the call to come in. He just didn't kick the pit in. He didn't make the entrance to the pit in. And as a result, got stuck out there. Now, it took him a little while to try to figure out what to do. The right thing it would have done in my estimation is pull him in the next lap you would have lost track position but you would have had all this time to make it up now though they're in a very very hard situation to win we couldn't ask for it to be any better the top three contenders in the daytona prototype class are in the top three positions in this race fogarty on screen leads by just under five seconds over max angelelli there is max and shadowing angelelli is salvador duran the young mexican who teamed with juan pablo montoya and scott pruitt at this year's rolex 24 to be victorious so it's out of these three cars in the top three positions who will be crowned champion in the next two hours. And this is the real key right now. If they maintain these positions and we, if we think, you know, calculations are accurate in terms of the 99 car potentially losing this race, the 10 car would clinch the championship right now. They would leapfrog ahead of the 01. So this is the battle between these two teams. We've seen them go out of for so many years. The 01 versus the 10. We're seeing it here again, Dawes. Yep, the 99 to win is going to have to have a lot of help, I think. But think about the GT boys. I mean, there's been a rough and tumble battle here as well. Paul Edwards in the 07 Banner Engineering Pontiac GXPR not only set the pole, but this car has been the dominant car in the GT class today. They're a long way back as far as championship standings are concerned, so they knew it was always going to be a long throw. They needed some misfortune to happen to their rivals. Well, it did for Andy Lally, who was second in the championship and we will tell you about that right now because if you've just joined us, let's bring you up to date with what has been a very eventful and interesting race thus far. After a clean start in the Daytona prototype, Seth Ingham went off track and came back on in spectacular fashion, taking out one of the GT title contenders. The 70 speed source car, then Will Notamaker went off track. There's been a lot of punctured tires here today, and that was an example of it. Got the Salins Corvette back on the road. Championship contender Max Angelelli mixing it up with Patrick Long and Bill Orblin. Long was the big winner there, but it was short-lived because Orblin came back. In the second hour, speaking of the Lug Luggage Express car, Orblin, great inside move. This was for third overall on Maymo Gidley, who had a dynamic start. And great to see the Doran back up at the front of the field. Patrick Long, spin all by himself. And two guys there, most notably Max Angelelli, taking good evasive action and keeping the SunTrust car clean. 
This was what we were alluding to. Championship hopeful, multi-time Rolex GT champion, Andy Lally, taken out of the race with a blown engine and a rare blown engine for TRG. His day went up in smoke and the championship hopes done. Then Brad Yeager took over from Mamo Gidley in the Kodak Doran and came to a rapid halt out on track. Just two cautions here today as we move up ahead into the third hour and there's some pretty stiff action. Colin Brown getting in to Jan Magnussen and Jan giving as good as what he got. There's a bit of feeling between these two teams and it was demonstrated nicely there. This battle went on in excess of 10 laps. It was quite gripping stuff. And in the end, the teenager won the battle with the former F1 star and drove away from the SunTrust car. However, the roles have been reversed. Bert Frizzell enjoyed some time in the lead of the race and was able to gather the AIM Autosport Lexus Riley back up. We transitioned through to the fourth hour where there was the most interesting caution period because this could be the defining moment in the race. John Fogarty did not come in when the caution flew and Scott Pruitt did. Just remember that point in the race because we'll be talking a lot more about it. And then just a few moments ago, Angelelli just nudges Salvador Duran out of the way and says, hey, out of the way, mate, I want to win this championship. I'm coming through. And finally, now, after a long period of time out on the track, the 99 has been on pit road, serviced, and back out on track. Well, this is dramatic stuff here. The chips are now all on the table. The 99 car will need another pit stop. For more on that, let's get down to Brian. Well, it was four tires and fuel, as you would expect. Uh, John Fogarty stayed in the car, the crew taking time to put a new cool box in and a new drink bottle for Fogarty. They did not change the driver, so John's still in that car. The car looked like it was in good shape. But you guys talked about it. That one missed radio communication after all the miles of competition this year could come down the championship to that one radio call. You know, Brian, I did the exact same thing in a Trans Am race where I was the leader of the race. The pits are closed. You're waiting for the pit stop and you get the call. Do you want to come in or not? You get it and all of a sudden you just missed the entrance. That's enough to lose the championship. It certainly lost me that race. Right now we have 46 laps to go in this event. They've been running around about 29, 30 laps under green flag, racing on one full fuel load. So that would mean that John Fogarty would be about 17 laps shy. So that'll take about 20 seconds to put that fuel in the car when he makes that next pit stop. We expect the other leaders of this race to make a full fuel load stop and then need a splash. By all calculations, they'll be about four to five laps shy to get to the checkered flag today. Now, I'm surprised they left John Fogarty in the car, to be quite honest, but he's been out there quite a long time. He's been driving really, really hard because we realize he's going to have to come in, so he's been putting in some qualifying type laps. Time is so crucial here. How long was that stop, Ryan? Well, the stop was exactly 40 seconds flat from when the wheels stopped until they turned and Fogarty left his pit box. Now, that means they took a completely full load. It did not take them any extra time to do that cool suit change. And the probe went in as soon as the car was stopped. And it was 40 seconds when they pulled out and Fogarty rolled away. So they definitely got a full load of fuel in that car. They'll see if they can conserve a little bit. Remember, they were so good on that first run with making a long stint out of that first load of fuel. They need to do that right now. Wow, Johnny O'Connell in the 06, a guy that you don't see make mistakes often, has spun Manor Pontiac. No contact with the, uh, with the wall or anything. I don't know if they, he had help or whatever. Further down the order, that car had been running up in the top four positions. Not quite sure what happened with Johnny O. The replay may tell us more. No, nope, nobody around. Johnny too hot. Gets on the throttle, too much speed at the exit of that corner, and around he goes. Chris? Lee just checked in with that team, and that car was running up near the front just a while back, but they had some problems with the rear suspension on that car. The team is thinking that that goes back to practice this morning. The 06 had contact with the number three prototype during that practice. They thought they had taken care of the damage, but uh, that car was in pit lane for a while here. They had to do, I think I think they said it was a wheel bearing change, um, change out of wheel bearing on the, the left rear of the car. So maybe not everything quite fixed on the car, and that's what Johnny's dealing with on the racetrack. Let's uh, update you with the revised order since the 99 has stopped. Max Angelelli has inherited the race lead over Salvador Duran. Ryan hunter -Ray is having a superb performance for Riley Matthews Racing. Mark Wilkins in four, and Nick Johnson for Chrome Racing tops out the five. Sports cars on speed, and this is championship day here at the Sun Chaser 1000 at Miller Motorsports Park in Utah. And we have got a very interesting race right to the very end 
When we went to the break, Max Angelelli was the race leader. Now it is the Ganassi driver, Salvador Duran in the Telmex Zero One Lexus Riley. And to our surprise, the 10 SunTrust car has just pitted. Back out on track and it has Jan Magnus behind the wheel. What's your take on that? Well, that's a little bit strange. I don't believe they short filled on the previous stop and uh, they could have gone a lot more further for our calculations if they had a full fuel load on board. So they're certainly playing some strategy games down there and uh, everyone is uh, pulling all the cards out of their pocket, Dorsey. Well, let's, let's find out, Dorsey, excuse me just a moment. Let's find out from Wayne Taylor what they're up to. Wayne Taylor, that was a tremendous stop. 27 seconds, tires, fuel, and a driver change. The boys up here, upstairs scratching their heads right now. They don't quite get it. You want to explain it to them? No, no, no. Wait until the end. <laughs> we'll, we'll let them know at the end. It's too early to tell them. I think he's got cards up his sleeves that we don't know about yet, guys. Well, short of there being something wrong with the driver, with Max, or something with the short fuel, which I don't think it is, the one thing they might be trying to do is get two very quick stops in. They just did one of them. They will definitely have to stop one more time, and they'll have to do a splash, and it could be another very quick stop. Um, but that's a funny the way to play it. The only thing I can see is, you know, by taking these shorter stints, you'd put tires on both times, and you'd have fresher tires for each stint. If you run one run, unless the tires are going off and they're losing lap time that way, they'd gain some advantage. But other than that, I'm not quite sure why they made that call. And, and we really haven't seen a lot of tire or, or speed drop right. with the tire wear. We've seen these guys running 30 laps, 31 laps, and still running within, you know, the same second of what they would have done with new tires. So the revised order is this man here, Salvador Duran. Ryan hunter Ray is up to second in the Riley Matthews machine. Then Nick Johnson, Ryan Dial is fourth. Then Jan Magnussen, Eric Lux making his DP start with Southern Motorsports, sharing the ride with Shane Lewis, doing a nice job. However, I think he may uh, be bordering on a pit stop shortly. More from the pits. Well, we've heard from Wayne Taylor and uh, we watched the pit stop on the 99. Tim, we're shaking our heads. Do you have any idea what these guys are up to and how does it play into your strategy? I think what the 10 car is doing, they're doing two short stops instead of doing one long and one short. And I think that they were going to be out of time on Angelelli. I think they're probably going to put him in again at the end. So they'll probably have another 23 second stop. Really, everybody's on the same strategy. We got to haul the mail and, uh, you know, just hope ours works out better than theirs. I mean, it's all coming down to really seconds right now and how good a clear laps you can get when you got clear laps you got to be able to make up the time i mean this is this really neat actually we just need to keep all in the mail keep all in the mail they got scott the mailman pruitt in there right now guys and like i said earlier 14 races and it's all coming down to this well this is brilliant absolutely brilliant 13 races eight months covering the championship we've raced in three different countries and as Tim Keane said it there it's all coming down to seconds it is and all three of the championship contenders are running a different strategy Dorsey we had the 99 car they either made a mistake or go in their direction 10 car we've seen they've come in early and the 01 look like they're going to stretch the fuel as far as they can and take a splash at the end and Tim Keane said something else that interested me he says getting your car back out on the racetrack where there's not cars where you can run those haul the mail laps and really get those speeds in because what's going to happen when everybody comes to that last fuel stop that's going to be when we see how close this really is. Tim thinks it's going to be within seconds between the three cars. Well, the 99's got the most to make up, but the other two cars, I, I agree, they're going to be right together. Great performance from Ryan hunter Ray, who enjoyed six starts in the IndyCar Series this year. He sits second at the moment, doing a great job for Riley Matthews. The Doran is in, the Ford Power, the only Ford powered machine is on pit road once more. Ryan Dial enjoying some time at the front of this field as well. And Justin Wilson for Mike Shank Racing in the Lexus powered Riley. He's up in the top five now. Brian Frizzell back to eighth. Patrick Long is ninth. And Shane Lewis has just taken over from Eric Lux. He's in the 10 also. The 99 car would like to see a yellow. This is not a racetrack you see many yellows at. We've had two in this race so far. One big accident early on. The other one to clean up some debris and an oil spill. But uh, without the yellow, yeah, this car right here, the 99, has the most to do on the racetrack. He's going to have to make up a lot of ground well, with speed. Well, the key is, Dorsey, right now the 99 car is behind the 10 car and they both need to stop for fuel. Because Magnuson stopped so early, he'll need more than a splash, probably about the same as what this car will need in terms of how much fuel needs to go into the tank. So maybe the 10 car calculated, when can we stop and ensure that we stay ahead of this car in terms of track position? That is what they've now done. If they maintain the same pace, they have equal pit stops, so we'll finish ahead of the 99 car at the end of this race. And track position is paramount here because what we talked about before, the layout of this racetrack is not conducive to a lot of opportunity to make a good pass. 
And Magnussen has just got by the 60 as well, so he's put a car in between he and John Fogarty. Let's talk GT because it's looking good for Dirk Werner. Last year's Porsche Carrera Cup champion in Germany. Points as of now would have him win this title. The 87 Van Bakkerlohl's car is third, the sister car is second, and it is still the banner engineering Pontiac of Paul Edwards that leads the way. Chris. Lee, obviously a lot of question marks still in the prototype ranks, but the picture definitely getting clearer in GT. Dirk, everything kind of going your way today. Paul Edwards, Kelly Collins going to need a lot of help to win this championship. Do you just shadow him the rest of the way here? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, two hours to go still. So uh, we already saw some cars struggling. We don't want to be one of them. So we decided to cruise around now and to bring the car home. And uh, I mean, Bryce is doing a good job and I think Wolf has a lot of experience to, to carry the car around the track. So car is well prepared and I hope it will last and we don't have an incident with another car. Talking about those cars that have struggled, two Porsches from TRG, brand new motors, both of them failed. TRG, Kevin Buckler has no idea why the motors failed. Any concerns within your camp about uh, these Porsche motors? I don't have an idea too, but I, I only hope that our motor will last. Um, I think Porsche will analyze it after the race, but so far we just have to hope and uh, keep the revs slow so that we don't uh, make the engine too much stress. Uh, Derek Renner out here pacing around the paddock, watching these minutes tick by and hopefully a championship coming his way. And over the past month, Chris, he hasn't exactly been sitting around because the GT boys have had a rest uh, since the last round. He did the Spa 1000 and then last weekend he won the Silverstone 24 hour with Dieter Cuesta, Jamie Campbell, Walter and Hans Stuck's son, Johannes, in a BMW Z4 Coupe. He thoroughly enjoyed that, so he's been doing plenty of driving, and points as of now would see him win it over the Pontiac duo by 10 points. You see Andy Lally and RJ Valentine back there in fourth on the points as of now standings. It's a bit of a sad story. We showed you in the wrap-up earlier what happened. It was a blown engine. Let's hear what Andy had to say when the boys caught up with him in pit lane post that. <laughs> I want to give a big thanks to my teammate this year, RJ Valentine. He's been super, incredibly supportive, and uh, CRG and all our sponsors, TRG, uh, F1 Air, I just can't thank these guys enough. Adobe Road for getting behind us all year. I had a great year. We had five years, uh, five wins on the season, and uh, RJ and I teamed up to be a good pair, and uh, Kevin Buckler and these guys uh, have put in a ton of effort all year long, and I, you know, I, I can't thank them enough. And, uh, it, it didn't end on a great note here for us, but it was still a good season. It, it's certainly an emotional roller coaster this weekend to come in here. This was our fourth year in a row vying for a championship coming into the last race of the season, and uh, it just didn't work out this time. But, you know, chin up and we move on to the next race. Just goes to show what a classy individual and driver Andy Lally is, and whether you're a GT driver or a DP driver, he has grabbed everybody's admiration this year. He really has been the Superman of the Rolex Sports Car Series in 2007. Speed's coverage of the Rolex Sports Car Series is brought to you by Rolex, a crown for every achievement. By Ruby Tuesday, simple, fresh American dining and by Lexus and their pursuit of perfection. That's exactly what everyone's striving for here today, perfection. The 87 Farnbacher Lowell's marquee jet Porsche has just visited pit lane. A driver change, Bryce Miller over to the very fast Wolf Hensler. And will Wolf take it all the way to the checkered flag? We've still got a good period of time left in this race, some 40 odd laps to take it to the checkered flag here at Miller Motorsports Park. The final round of the Rolex Sports Car Series. This could be, and if everything goes to plan, should be the championship winning car in GT with Dirk Werner. And Wolf will be in cruise and collect mode. He's not gonna run the revs. He won't run the engine as high as he normally would. No need to put stress on it. You know, they just need to go 40, 40 more laps and just take it real easy. The win just by staying on that racetrack. Overall race leader and Daytona prototype class leader is Salvador Duran. For the 01 Telmex Chip Ganassi Racing with Felix Sabatis. And it has been out there for some 27 laps, so pit stop coming up soon. 
Yeah, I mean, normally they've been running 29, 30 lap under green. They did have that caution period, so they'll probably stretch that, I would think, to the 32, 33 lap mark. But again, they can play some games too. Timmy King will be looking at what everyone else has done and make a strategy call from there. But we certainly expect them to take a full fuel load and need a splash. They should be about five laps short on fuel at the end. It's always very easy to be critical, Dorsey, but let's give a shout out to the two young Mexican drivers, Salvador Duran, Maymo Rojas. If you're going to be Scott Pruitt's teammate, you better perform. And both these kids have done so today. Yeah, absolutely right. They've done everything they're supposed to do, and they were under a lot of pressure to get this job done. All of these teams, all top three of them, knew to win this championship, they had to first win this race. And these guys have stepped up to the plate. Another young man who's done a great job today, Brian, Ryan Hunter Ray. Lee, Ryan Hunter Ray, IRL Rookie of the Year. And Ryan, we're used to seeing you in a formula car, but you were telling me earlier you just love to drive these Daytona prototypes. I was looking at my chops when it went green, when it went yellow there. I knew we had a good card. I knew we had them lined up in front of me. Uh, there was a couple that were pretty hard to pass, and that allowed uh, whoever was in the SunTrust car and the 01 car to get away, but I started catching them. And that's what racing's all about. That was a lot of fun. I, I really enjoyed that. One of the fastest cars on the racetrack when you brought the car in. When we look to the IRL for next year, we'd love to see you, obviously, in a Daytona prototype. What's next year look like for you? Well, I want to do both, you know? I mean, Ray Hall gave me a great opportunity there, a great team, and this is a great series, but um, I'd look to do as many as I can here, but I've got something to, to prove in the IRL. I think he's got a lot to prove, and he's proving it right now, guys. He's fast in anything he drives. Well, he left the Champ Car World Series rather unceremoniously, and that kind of left a bit of a bitter taste in his mouth, but the IndyCar Series has embraced him, and Ryan has performed when given the opportunity. A great young American driver, which is what everyone has been screaming out for. Yes. Good young American talent. He's right there. Let's hope a team, whether it be Ray Hall Letterman Racing or whoever it may be, pick him up and run with it. I talked to Buddy Rice this weekend, and he said, you know, come over here. These cars are they're hot inside and so forth, but this is really fun. You don't have the tension of the oval of running 190, 200 miles an hour all the time. He goes, these cars, you just drive the wheels off them, and it's a lot of fun. I'll tell you one thing about this group here, the 91 team. They've really turned things around. I think mid-season, they realize, why are all the customer cars, all the Riley chassis running so good? They get the spec sheets from Bill Riley. They go out and run fast. We seem to be a little off base. I think they went back to the basic setup, and suddenly they were at the top of the timesheets regularly in the practice session. So really great job by this team. Jim Matthews has really stepped up as well, and Goosens, as we know, is a fast driver, and you put he and Ryan Hunter Ray together. That's a really poor in combination there. Brian do, you want, Brian, do you want to put a period on Hunter Ray? Well, you know, we talk about how fast he is. I watched him come up through the Atlantic rakes and everything, and obviously a talent. It was funny to listen to him just now. He said, I was trying to get the cool suit to work, and it wouldn't, and it's just hotter than hell in those cars. A little different than the open-wheel cars I'm used to driving, so obviously a lot of work. We've talked about it all year long, how brutal it is in the cockpit of these Daytona prototypes. And Brian Hunter Ray letting us know just how hot it is. There's no championship on the line for these boys in green at Crone Racing, but there is a race win on the line, and the 75 has not done that in season 2007. A, a point of frustration, no doubt, Brian. Colin Brown taking back over. Nick Johnson just climbed out, and this car showing the battle scars are running here at Utah. Not only does it get sandblasted from all the debris and the rocks and the sand on the track, but a lot of contact on the front end of the 75. Colin Brown really, really giving Yan Magnuson a go earlier. And right now, Colin Brown probably going to take the 75 to the checkered flag. And Brian, that's a good point. I, I'm really I'm surprised they haven't taken that nose off with the big hole in it and on one of these lengthier stops put a new nose on because they're losing a certain amount of downforce with the hole there, particularly when they're behind another car. Absolutely, and what happens is the air gets in there and actually causes lift on the front of the nose. So depending on the balance, I mean, if the car was a little bit loose, it may have been held <laughs> true. Things, but uh, you'd have to think it was hurting them somewhat. And that's a pretty quick change, unless something goes wrong on changing that. If the nose clips are broken and you've got some issues or worries there, you wouldn't do it. But it looks like it's just a piece of fiberglass. It should have been a quick change for those boys. So it's the 0-1 of Salvador Duran. Colin Brown, as we know, has just stepped on board the 75. Magnuson's up there in the top three. John Fogarty now. And the gap between those guys is around about six seconds, five and a half seconds between Magnuson and Fogarty. Then Goosens, then Brian Frizzell. Patrick Long has got by Ryan Dial, then Shane Lewis and Oswaldo Negri in the top ten. Max Pappas in the second crone car just outside the ten. And Hurley Haywood there in his farewell drive as a full-time sports car racer. He will work a limited program uh, next year, but he takes over the reins as team manager at Brumos Racing.
07 continues to lead and dominate this event. And we reflect back on Montreal where the car was running third until the final lap and dropped to eighth. That was a seven point swing for this car. And here we see him coming in. We looked at the championship standings as of now, they would lose it by 10. So I guess that would be an easier thing to swallow at the end of this season if they were certainly outside of that seven point margin that they lost at Montreal. Was something different coming into the 2007 season transitioning from the all-conquering Pontiac GTO-R to this new longer wheelbase GXPR. Leighton Reese with a lot of responsibility at Banner Engineering, working with Pratt & Miller, deciding on what their drivers, who their drivers would be. But all in all, they've done a very good job this year. Chris? Paul Edwards pulling the car into the box here. Kelly Collins going to be getting behind the wheel, probably going to be finishing out the day. You were talking about this team and the GTO are, like we saw last year, winning so many races. This team splitting only two wins, one, one between the 06, one between the 07. The 07 car was last in victory lane back at Birmingham just a couple months ago. Uh, this team uh, was making an air pressure adjustment to the front tires just right before the car came in. It was kind of a, a late call. It didn't even look like they were going to get it done prior to the car getting to pit lane, but they finished it up. They wanted to add a little air pressure to the car because they've been having a difficult time trying to adjust it during the stint, really going uh, on all spectrums on, on the bars on the car, trying to get the handling the way they want. But they have been able to stay out in front of the Farnbacher cars all day long. However, they're going to need a lot of help if they want to win this championship because Dirk is going to have to finish outside the top 10. No urgency required from the Farnbacher Lowell's 87. That was the 85 of Ian Boss we just saw in the sister car on screen right there. The shoes for Cruz Porsche has done very, very well today. And there is the gap with the banner Pontiac now released as you look back towards Ian Boss. So the countdown continues, less than 40 laps left to run here at Miller Motorsports Park. And it is far from decided, certainly in the Daytona prototype class. Well, it'll be a nice change of pace tomorrow morning at 7.30 Eastern here on Speed, where they can stop talking about $100 million fines and start talking about racing again in Formula One. The World Championship continues. Kimi Raikkonen is on pole for the Belgium Grand Prix. 7.30 tomorrow morning, live here on Speed. Don't miss it. We're back. You're watching Sports Cars on Speed. Salvador Duran will be coming in momentarily in the 01 to hand over to Scott Pruitt. Can he drive himself to a second Daytona prototype championship? It's never been done. There's never been a repeat winner in the Daytona prototype class. Terry Borcello won the inaugural one in 03. Pruitt and Pappas won in 04. Then Taylor and Angelelli won in 05. And last year, of Here course, Jorg Bergmeister. Here comes Duran. A late entry into pit road. It doesn't matter, though. He is there, and Pruitt will be standing by, and the Ganassi team to go to work. We heard Tim Keane say before, we need to make one full stop and one splash and go. What a great job this young man has done. He impressed the team so much at Daytona. Not only his own teammates, but guys like Dan Weldon said, this guy is fast. Brian? Stops it on the marks. You heard Tim Keene earlier say, we need to haul the mail. I told you, Scott, the mailman, Pruitt, is going to get in and take the championship in his own hands, take the car to the checkered flag and see if he can win his second Daytona prototype championship. No one has ever repeated. There's not been a repeat championship in the Daytona prototype category. Pruitt trying to look to make it, it car really close to the wall, making it a little bit difficult for the crew members. They're going to need to take a full load of fuel here. Four tires, see if they can make this thing to the end if they were to get a full course caution. We think they could be a few laps short. Pruitt now underway. Stop, 33 seconds. That's a very good stop for fuel, driver change, and tires. Well, right now they've got 35 laps to go. We've been seeing 29, 30 under green, so they'll be about five laps shy. And there was almost a critical mistake there by the fact that he pulled in very tight to that wall. The guys were able to get the wheels on and off, but that could have been a huge deal. And here we see the battle for the lead. Magnussen comes by, so he's overtaken Pruitt. Pruitt will get back out in front of John Fogarty. Again, the top three in the championship are the top three in the race. This is it, and all will need to make one more stop to the finish. And this is what Wayne Taylor was on about. Look at it at the end. Right now, we understand all three of those cars will need fuel. So for the 10 car to win this championship, they need to win the race, and they need the 01 car between them and the 99, and right now they have that. In track position, again, most important of all things, all cars will stop. You want to be in the lead one. 
This is going to be a battle right here because Pruitt's on cold tires. He's a little bit uh, slow for at least one lap. He's going to try and hold him off as best he can, and Fogarty has to be careful here. Right now, as we understand that these three last pit stops, the O1s will certainly be faster than the 99 car, so they're certainly in good shape right now. And Pruitt had to sit behind Fogarty for an elongated period of time earlier, so now it's Fogarty's turn to do it. And it's not Salvador Duran in the car, it is Pruitt. We saw him get in in pit lane. So this will be very interesting and we'll get you a time split when they come around next time in between Jan Magnussen back to the 0-1 of Pruitt and you can see Fogarty right there. Mark Goosens is in the mix as well. Don't discount the 91. Colin Brown is fifth. Brian Frizzell is sixth. Long, Lewis, Negri and Thomas Enger is in the top ten in the Samax entry. And Scott Pruitt's got by the hard part. He's got the tire temperature coming up. He's got the tire pressures coming up. You can see it now. The car coming to pick up on speed. He did what he had to do to keep that position. Right, right now I'm looking at this thing, boys. I really think the O1 car is in pretty good shape because their pit stop is going to be so much faster. Remember, Magnussen stopped early. He's got 44 laps to go to get to the checkered flag. If he runs 30, then he makes his stop. We'll need 14 laps of fuel. That's going to be a much longer stop. Well, it's Magnussen's been out there for nine laps. Perhaps Fogarty's been out there for 11 since they stopped. Pruitt, as you say, Cal, has a full tank of fuel. He holds the advantage right now. We'll see how it shakes out, though. What a day it has been in Utah. <laughs> and Judy Pruitt getting one back on everyone else who's poked fun at her husband. Good on you, Jude. Taylor Racing and SunTrust. Jan Magnussen leads the way by some five seconds over Scott Pruitt. But does Pruitt hold the advantage? That's the question that needs to be answered. The last one to come in and stop for fuel of the three of these championship contenders, and they all need to stop again at least once, just for a splash and go. But at the moment, it looks like Pruitt may hold the upper hand. Goosens is trying to go with John Fogarty. He could be a bit of a spoiler and take championship points away from the Gaines Co. crew. And that is something that they do not need. Points as of now, Angelelli would win it by one over Pruitt. And Gurney and Fogarty would go from leading this championship coming into this final round to third. What a swing. Each of the three combinations knew that they had to win this motor race to win this championship. Brian? Well, Lee, really, the guys in the 99, they're looking to the 10 car. They want to keep the 01 behind him. The 10, they said, he can go past. If the 10 car wins and we finish second, we still end in a tie. We win the championship. It's the 01 that really is the thorn in their side right now. We just documented that pit stop. Scott Bruitt now in the car. They'll need a splash at the end. It's the 99, or it's the 01 that the 99 really is paying attention to. So that's very smart because if you do end up in a tie, it will go to the tiebreaker becomes who's won the most races in the year. That clearly is the 99. Well, there's no comparison, is there? Seven race victories to the 99 up against two for the 10. Yeah, but first the 99 cars to get around yeah, the exactly. Mempola gap because their pit stop's going to be longer. So they have a lot of work to do here this afternoon or they need a problem for Pruitt. Even a slight delay, a spin, any kind of incident for Pruitt would help them out. But if it keeps going as it is with all these three guys running at their pace, I still believe the 01 is in the best position right now. Just to update you on GT, Kelly Collins still leads the way over Lee Keenan, Wolf Hensler, two Porsches continuing to follow the Pontiac. Jeff Siegel in the, uh, in the Mazda is running in fourth place and Greg Wilkins for Doncaster is running fifth and uh, it's a big day for Emil Asentato in that speed source 69 Mazda because he is having a great tussle with Joe Nonemaker for the Bob Aiken Award in GT class for sportsman drivers who are non-professional drivers so we wish both of those guys the best of luck and Tracy Crone hasn't won it yet in the DP class but it's pretty close between he and Mark Patterson so for the, uh, the non-professional for the sportsman drivers Good luck for the remainder of this race. And speaking of Mazda and Emil Asentado going for that Aiken Award, let's hear from a very significant man from that company. Chris? Well, we talked to Sylvan Tremblay and Nick Hamp earlier. Obviously, disappointment from those two drivers. Another guy who was a little disappointed, John Doonan from Mazda Motorsport North America. But, John, it's not just about the short term. It's some of the long-term goals that Mazda has within the series, too, right? Absolutely. It was a disappointing start to the day, but uh, we're thrilled. The 69 car is doing so well in fourth, and the Hypersport boys are 10th. We're real pleased with that. Soapy came on board for those guys, and 
the whole program, we talked even at Daytona about a customer program, and you know we've got another car coming for Daytona, Formula Mazda team, Mundo Motorsports has uh, purchased the car. I think we might have sold a couple more here this weekend, so you know, it's great to have more numbers out there, and that's what we're all about, growing, uh, growing the class. Now this GT field just keep getting bigger. 69 runs in the top four in class. That'd be a nice way to finish the year out for the Speed Source crew who was so harshly dealt with on the opening lap of this race. The 70, a three-time race winning car this year, demolished before the end of the opening lap. It's a big off-season coming up for the Brumos Racing Organization. The uh, headquarters for the racing team will be moved from southern Florida to Charlotte in North Carolina. And not only that, but there is a very big change from the famous 59 because no longer on a permanent basis will their main man, Hurley Hayward, be steering this car. I've been blessed ever since the start of my career to race for really great teams. You know, when you win a race, you can't win the race unless you've got a great team behind you. And I've just been really lucky in choosing and being careful to choose the right teams that can take me to Victory Lion. I have really no, no regrets in my career. My career has worked beautifully for me personally. Uh, I've been able to do the kind of racing that I wanted to do, which is sports car racing. I've been able to capitalize that into business opportunities. After three decades at the top of sports car racing, Haywood will now run a limited schedule. And I think about next year, you know, it kind of, it, it's, I'm going to miss the, the, the driving on a regular basis because the driving kind of keeps me pinpointed, keeps me sharp, keeps me in good shape, keeps me focused. And that focus will now turn to being team manager for Brumos Racing, a role filled for the last 30 years by his friend and mentor, Bob Snodgrass, who passed away this year. We want to put the best possible program together with Brumos to see if we can win races and get ourselves on the podium and uh, do good, uh, you know, in, in memory of Bob and, and doing the things that he has set up, the standards that he's set for us to try to strive for and make our whole program, uh, you know, step, step it up a notch. There is no other driver in this country who has driven such a variety of Porsche's legendary races and there was no one better at it than Hurley Haywood. When people remind me that I've been doing this for 35 years, you know, I kind of look at them and I go, what? 35 years? 35 years is a long time. But, you know, when you've been doing something um, that you've had so much fun in doing, it, it seems like a very short period of time. And when you take a look back at where I started, and what kind of cars I was driving, and then you look all through the years as you go through and, and you analyze all the different kind of cars I drove from, you know, 911s when they were basically right out of the showroom floor onto a racetrack, to the super prototypes, to the DPs now, to 935s, 962s. I mean, it's just a gamut of, of some of the world's greatest sports cars that have ever been made, and it's just, uh, it, it, it seems like yesterday. It seems, 35 years just seems like it's just flown by like that. And we thank and congratulate Hurley Haywood, even though this is Terry Borchella in the car, we thank him for his service to motorsport and sports car racing. And someone very close to him earlier this weekend told me that when Bob Snodgrass died, it really and understandably took the wind out of Hurley's sails. But he didn't give up, he didn't throw the towel in, he's finished the season off. And that just underscores the guy's tenacity, doesn't it? The nice thing was talking to him this morning, Lee, was that there was no sadness. He's very philosophical about it. He realizes his driving time was great, and he's ready to move on to that next role within the Brumos organization. And I can relate to his 35 years going by like that. Yeah. <laughs> Twice. Twice. Yeah, not, we're not that bad. Look at this, boys. Look at this. First to second, Jan Magnuson and Scott Pruitt. Pruitt wants to grab hold of this championship and run with it. Jan Magnussen is trying to deliver it for the 10 SunTrust team and Max Angelelli, but Pruitt is going after it all for himself. And then there's almost a four second margin 
back to John Fogarty sitting in third place at the moment. Pruitt's been the quicker of the two cars, no doubt about that. He's been running them in, but look here. Here comes John Fogarty right behind the three, or right behind those two. But Pruitt today has just been immaculate. He's been extremely fast. The car looks really good. We have to wonder with that increased engine horsepower that we're looking at, whether they've been able to run a little bit more downforce. We know the Ganassi guys always have to trim that car out to maintain straightaway speed. Maybe they've been able to gain that engine power and hence use more downforce. So the cars look very stable, really hooked up all day long. Additional downforce, Calvin, is going to help guys like Memo Rojas, but that power plant in the back, you should note that the 60 car of Michael Shank Racing had a problem today with an alternator belt. It's the fifth one they've lost this season from an identical Lexus power plant. So we always like to say it's not over until it's over. And right now, you got to wonder, we're getting to that part of the race where guys are starting to hear a little bit more noise and the boys down at Chip Ganassi Racing know that there have already been problems with this new Lexus power plant down pit road. Well, I'll tell you one thing. One thing I've seen today about Scott Pruitt, A, he's on the top of his game. He's doing oh. a really, really good job. B, that engine is putting out a lot of horsepower. C, it is not getting as good a fuel mileage as the other cars. It, it's happening to stop a, a lap or two early. Well, this is like an engine, engine dyno, this racetrack, this long front straightaway. And here we look at it. Look pretty even there. Scott certainly jockeying around, trying to distract Jan Magnussen, but he has enough experience not to fall for that one. Just maintains his line, gets a good clean run through turn one. And I really don't think they're worried about an alternator belt. You see Scott back there with the headlights on. That's burning up some electricity, you know. So I, I don't think that's a concern. A belt coming off, well, that's a little bit strange. It happens sometimes. But you just look at the lines that Scott Pruitt is able to run with these cars. A lot tighter coming off the corner. He's not using as much road. Just look like that car is hooked up this weekend. Lexus has only had the one victory in season 2007, and it was the big one at the Rolex 24 at Daytona. Can Pruitt bookend the season? and snatch the championship as well. We're going to know within the next hour or so. Stick around, don't go anywhere. It's championship day here in Utah, the Rolex Sports Car Series on speed. Speed's coverage of the Rolex Sports Car Series is brought to you by Ruby Tuesday. Simple, fresh American dining. And powered by Pontiac and the 260 horsepower Solstice GXP. You're not going to believe this. Just when we go away, something happens. There's been signs of smoke coming from the back of this 10 SunTrust car. And did Magnuson run a little wide there? There's some reports of perhaps oil coming from the back of the 10. And what I have observed about this is it happens only in left-hand corners. That dictates that it's an oil leak. For sure, if it was coming out of an engine or engine blowing up, well, it'd do it all the time. If it only does it in the left-hand corner, it means that something off the right side of the engine is leaking oil. Now, there can be a catch can back there, which gets it. We'll see it right here. There's a catch can that grabs oil that overflows, overflows, and if that gets full, it can dump out on that, if it's on that side of the car. I don't know that it is, but you'll only see it happening when it gets hard into a left-hander. Seems to have uh, dissipated somewhat. <laughs> that could it? be mean he's out of oil to do that. Yeah. <laughs> Very astute observation to like us. when the water temperature gets starts falling, it means there's nothing left. Yeah. Closer look here. Look at the right side of the car behind the tire, and you see the wisp of blue that starts coming out. It gets harder as he goes through the corner. Like I said, it was an engine. He's in. The ten's yep. in. So Pruitt inherits the race lead. Fogarty bridged the margin there uh, to Scott Pruitt. So they're nice and close as Jan Magnussen brings the car in. Is he getting ready for Angelelli? Yeah, he is. He got his belts loose. Brian, tell us more. Is this it? Is it now down to two in the championship? I'm looking at the back of this SunTrust machine. There is a fair amount of debris, and I see a lot of smoke out of the right side. There's also oil on the transmission case. I'm looking underneath the back of the car, and I see a little bit of oil on the back of the gearbox. Officials rubbing the back of the car right now, seeing if it is moist. You see the smoke, it's coming from up underneath the transmission, guys. So I can't tell if that's an engine seal or a transmission seal. Nothing leaking on the ground, but definite smoke out of the bottom of this number 10 car. Officials saying it looks okay, not a lot of oil leaking out. Angelelli now underway, but definite problems here on the 10. Now see if that official was a true mechanic, race mechanic, he would have, he would have got that finger full and he would put it on his tongue and tasted it and let, <laughs> he would have known which it was. But he didn't. 
we'll see you are old school. There's a different taste between oil and gearbox. <laughs> well, there was a, a, a fist pump and a hand clap there from Wayne Taylor. He was pretty pumped about that stop. He was pleased with his boys' performance. Back at the front, though, it is Scott Pruitt holding off a very determined John Fogarty. And John Fogarty's now in a position strategy-wise where he would be in the window to make that final stop and get to the checkered flag here this afternoon. Got about 27 laps to run, so that's why the 10 car made their stop. Fogarty and the Gain School boys in a similar position. Very impressed with the composure from Fogarty and the Gain School crew when they were in the hot seat. Everyone saw that they should have come in on that caution. They've kept their composure. Kyle Brandon, the engineer, he wasn't too pleased with what went down, but the drivers have done a very good job. Let's hear more about the SunTrust boys. Well, Wayne Taylor running around down here trying to get this team sorted out, trying to keep that championship alive for Max. Wayne, what is it? Do you know? No, there was, uh, there was a little bit of a smoke coming out. We thought it was a water. We, we saw a water spike, but uh, in fact, it was uh, we think it was a tire rub, and uh, we wanted to get Max in the car, and uh, guys did an outstanding job. I think it was 26 seconds. So a very quick pit stop, they said. They wanted to get it in Max Angelelli's hands. Now we've got Pruitt. Angelelli, they hold their championship. What's going on with the 99? We'll have to wait and find out. Well, you know what? Tire rub is another thing that would happen if you just go on the left-hand corner. We'll have to see. Watch his crew. These guys think they've done a good job, and they have. And there's Wayne Simon. Taylor, please. Simon Hodgson, the team manager there, got so much experience in all forms of racing, particularly sports cars with Chip Ganassi a few years ago, so he knows how to win championships as well. well Calvin, you know, Wayne says he thinks it was it might have been tire up. I don't buy that. No. I looked at the car, I looked up underneath it, definitely some oil trails down the bottom of the gearbox, and I saw smoke coming from between the engine and the beginning of the gearbox up front. I think they've got a fluid leak somewhere. It may not be a major one right now, but Wayne did say they saw a spike on the water temperature gauge. So I think that engine is running, struggling a little bit right now at this high altitude. Tire up, why? Why so late? I didn't see any marks on the car. I didn't see any tire up. I don't know. I'm not buying it. Ryan, I didn't buy it either. It was just a tsunami. You know, it could have been. Yeah. I don't think so. That was oil smoke of some sort, but it might not be, you know, it might not be the death of the car yet either. If you like numbers and what they represent, see if you can read anything into this over the three big Enduros of the year. The 01 car at the Rolex 24 first, at the Watkins Glen six hour second. What will they have today? The 99 at the Rolex 24, that disastrous 22nd, but they bounce back at Watkins Glen to win it. What will they have today? And the 10 at both those two big Enduros, both third placings. It's all in front of us. It's all yet to be answered here in Salt Lake City. Stick around. That's what it's been like all day. Plenty of action here at Miller Motorsports Park in the Sun Chaser 1000. As things stand right now, with 25 laps to go, Scott Pruitt would win this championship by two points. Dirk Werner would win the GT championship in the vicinity of about 13. Brian, what's on your mind? Well, we know that Calvin is our strat uh, strategist, our guru that's up there. He's the one that works the calculator and the numbers. And my question, Calvin, is I'm looking at the 99. They've got to make a stop. They're in their window. They can make it to the end if they make the stop now. Why wouldn't you come now? I can understand you might troll for a yellow, but if you came now, put a fresh driver, fresh tires in, you've got a lot of time to get back to the front. The longer you wait, the less time you're going to have to get there. So I don't understand why that as soon as they got in their window, why they didn't make the call. Well, you're right, Brian. We've got 25 five laps to go they're well inside of that if they top them up with fuel to get to the checkered flag and I think that's one of the things that Carl Brown Brown will be mulling over they're really behind the eight ball right now they need somewhat of a small miracle to turn this thing around I think that what they'll be thinking about is if they do pit where they come out in traffic because the last thing you want to do is suddenly come back onto the racetrack I haven't made that final stop and behind a bunch of cars so Carl Brown and the team will try and be figure out when they can make that pit stop and come out in clean air possibly but I think the bigger question is when the nine 99 card pits how long does the l1 wait because we know they only need a splash timmy keen and the boys there will probably make that call a little bit sooner than later because if you have a yellow and they still need to pit you get stuck behind a slow gt car or something like that and the full course yellow is out that could cost you time and cost you this race as well 
Mark Goosens is in for his last stop. And Calvin, I just wonder too, the, lo the longer the 99 wait ma waits to make their last stop, the quicker the stop will be because they'll need less fuel. But they also are going to do a driver change, so that's going to take more time. So I think the longer the wait, the more trouble they get into. Right now, a very oh. smooth stop oh. for Goosens. It's tight oh. and a problem on the racetrack. Fogarty has hit Pruitt. Big inside move and Pruitt runs wide. No damage from what we can see at the moment. But aggressive stuff there from John Fogarty. He saw it and went oh, for it. Oh, and something's wrong. There's a puncher there. Right front I have down. to think that something's down there, Dorsey. Yeah, that right front just probably took the valve step yeah, up on the side of Pruitt. See him. And Pruitt's slow. Pruitt is slow in the background. Oh, where's the 10 car? Can the 10 car take advantage of this? Pruitt's got problems with his left rear, I believe. They probably both knocked valve stems off, in which Long case... Long way to go on this lap, too, Dorsey. Only halfway around this thing. Well, we know for sure the 99's front tire's down, and I think you're right. I think Scott Pruitt's got the left rear down. And you're right about another thing. It's four and a half miles back home for this, which will be the final pit stop. He'll be able to push hard through the right-hand turns. He's got to be careful under braking, of course, and through the left-handers. And, and Wayne Taylor come. will be telling Max Angelelli about what has transpired, what is going on up ahead of him. There it is, Flat for sure. left rear for Pruitt. Well, one question has already been answered. When will these guys be pitting? It'll be this next time. Replay of the contact. No, this, this was earlier, this was earlier, that this was, was about a lap or two ago. Yeah, that was Fogarty trying hard, got off with the outside tires, as we're about a puncture there. This was down into the corner. You see right now, Fogarty setting up this pass, ducks to the inside. Through protects. And now he's making it tight, but I mean, there's room for two, but here comes the contact. That's side that. side to side, you saw the right front tire hit the left rear. That's heavy braking down there into that black rock hairpin. And boy, and it's shit. Well, look at Pruitt's up immediately down there. You see the left rear on Pruitt's guy's down. Yeah, his rim was completely bent up. So Pruitt's rim actually took a big hit. Right front's down here. We knew that. That's probably the valve stem knocked off, if not the bent rim. But Pruitt's whole right tire. Now, here's the issue they can put a tire on, but how much suspension damage might there be? In yesterday's Coney Challenge race, there were multiple punctured tires. And now here, it's the same story for two of our top. Title oh, and here Rubber goes the flying tire. everywhere. And this can oh, take this the body disastrous. apart. Got to slow it down, Scotty. And he can and he can't. He's just really in a dilemma right now. It's going to blow the whole back body work off. There it goes. He's lost the tire cord. Now, meanwhile, Fogarty is already on pit road. Fogarty had a better deal with the front tire. They don't come apart. They don't have the big sidewall like the rear does. 99's coming your way, boys. Maybe okay. Oh, this oh, is a mess, then though. The downforce will be gone from the back of that car. They won't have time to fix it properly. Disaster. Here is the 10. Max Angelelli with the smoke still coming from the right rear. But, boy, this has played into the 10's hands now, hasn't it? As he comes through, debris on the track. Thrown from the 0-1 Telmex Ganassi car. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Brian. Threw it in. Massive damage to the left rear of this car. It's taken all the body work off, as you guys talked about. The question is, how much suspension damage? Uh, look inside. Other uh, problem is we've got belts from the car wrapped around the suspension pieces in the back, and this crew member stepping in with suspension pieces. Looks like perhaps one of the tie rods in the back is bent, and they're going to have to spend a lot of time doing lengthy repair here. Like I said, a lot of the steel belts from the tire wrapped around the suspension crew going to work championship is it over for scott pruitt but the other question is the contact on the racetrack will the 99 be back to pit road and how does the 10 make it to the end with an engine that continues to smoke well there's your question right there scott pruitt's done i can tell you that when that thing wrapped around the suspension it'll take them a long time to fix it 99's back on track the 10 is smoking if it should leave lose an engine well, the 99 looks good, but will he get a penalty for that contact? And the other thing that's going to come into play is not only a race about who beats who. Remember, if the 10 car wins, the 99 car has to finish right behind them. Some of these other players, the spoilers, may come into play and bring in that cushion in terms of the points and win it for the 10 machine. Let's hear from the 99 gang. John Fogarty getting out of the car, taking his... Chris... The 10 is off track, and it's another puncture tire, I think. It is. Unless it's he's slipping on his own oil. No, no. Is it a right puncture? Right rear puncture, Dorse? Big smoke. It looks like a right rear yeah, down. I think you called it. There, no way. So he will be coming in now. What drama. Who would believe this? Championship coming down to the wire, but no one expected this.
in the last hour or so. And he needs to get this back to pit lane without that tire doing what it did to Scott Pruitt's car. If it sheds that outer skin, it'll blow the back of the car off. There's the damage you can see from what happens when one of those takes off. And he's having to do about a half a lap too, Max Angelelli, to get his car back to the pit lane. So this is going to be crucial. How much damage is there to that 01 car, Brian? Well, a lot of the birdie work down the left side. The crew did not have to change the suspension. They locked it not to do that. But a lot of the aerodynamics gone off the back. The crews have said before, when you lose part of that spoiler in the back, you lose about 300 pounds. They lost the spoiler and a lot of body work as well, Chris. Well, Brian, not as much damage to the 99 machine. John, it was a quick pit stop. Team just had to replace tires, get, get Alex behind the wheel. But what happened on the racetrack? Uh, me and Scott were having a battle, you know, and he got held up by a Porsche kind of just took him to the outside of one of the fast sweepers. And I had an excellent run on him. He took me all the way down to the dirt on the inside. It's my opportunity, so I had to take it. Uh, stuck my nose in there, and he kept coming over, and I kept slowing down. And before we even got to the corner, we had contact. So it's not, not the way you really want to do things, but it looks like we came out on the top end, which is great for the Gainesville Auto Insurance car today. And uh, fortunately, uh, when it rains and pours, it looks like the 10 car is having a little bit of trouble right now. So. Hopefully we're going to come out, uh, come out with the championship here. Other than that puncture, is Alex reporting anything else wrong with the car? I haven't been on the radio with him. I don't think there's anything else. It looked pretty, pretty flush uh, and just kind of shredded up the sidewall of the tire. So uh, I think uh, I think we're in pretty good shape. Nobody seems to be freaking out there on the pit cart. So all right. Well, it's the last race of the year. Everybody's going to pull out the punches. Oh, and here we go. The same again. This is the Pruitt treatment for the 10 car. What would be the irony if maybe the 10 car caught a puncher from some of the bodywork of the 01? I mean, this is just unbelievable stuff. Oh, oh it's, it's on, on fire. fire. Big fire off the right side. That means he's probably got an oil line. That tire's probably shredded an oil line or a fuel line, and Max has got to be thinking about getting out. And that is championship over for Max Angelelli. He is trying to get back. There will be fire oh, marshals on pit, pit road. Lane. That is dangerous to bring this car into pit lane. He, he needs to be told to stop. He probably doesn't know since it's on the right rear side that he's got oh, this much fire. Team will know though, Dorsey. Bringing that car into pit lane with the fueling rigs is bad news. Just stop it right there. Stop it right there. Get out. For his own safety, he needs to get out of this vehicle. Forget the championship. Think about your safety, mate. Dramatic scenes here oh. at Salt Lake City at Miller Motorsports Park. Angelelli's championship campaign is over. Right here, right now. Get out, Max. In Good. the most dramatic style. Good work by the fire marshal. There's a fire truck that's got to him. That's what he was looking to keep going for. I wouldn't have stayed there that long. And that will be a motion overload. What a gripping final round. Wow, Max is out. I'm glad to see you get out of that car. That was that was getting pretty hairy there. Now to keep you up to date while we watch what's going on here, Colin Brown has gone to the lead of this race. Mark Goosens has been elevated to second. And Alex Gurney is in third place in the 99. And at this stage would win the championship. It has been deemed a racing incident from the Grand Am officials between John Fogarty and this man Scott Pruitt a racing incident so no penalty to the 99 the championship is coming their way as we stand I just cannot believe this this is and in the meantime the course of 10 minutes Brian is there with Angelelli Brian Max scary moments I know that the crew wants to make sure you're okay and everything but are you all right that's all we care about of course it's all right. I didn't want to stop. I needed to go and pit, and I couldn't. Unfortunately, I was running out of power, obviously for the fire. Awful. I cannot believe losing the championship this way for a puncher. And there is his team leader, Wayne Taylor, in disbelief. They thought they were in a position to clinch it. You heard it, a puncture. Your flat tire takes him out. And it has been characteristic of this race weekend. Whether it's the stones that surround this racetrack, whether it's debris from the various crashes we've had here today, but it has been a common thread. Speed's coverage of the Rolex Sports Car Series is brought to you by Ruby Tuesday, simple, fresh American dining. And by Porsche. Porsche, there is no substitute. The friends, the business partners, the team leader and his driver.
go back to the transporter to reflect on what could have been in disbelief. When we talk about a championship going down to the wire, down to the final round, everyone gets excited, but you never expect this kind of a finish. If you've just joined us, you have missed the most extraordinary scenes. We had the top three in the championship in the top three positions of this race the entire day of this 1,000 kilometre event. And in the last 10 minutes, mayhem has just broken out here at Miller Motorsports Park. There was contact between this car and the 01 going for the lead. John Fogarty contacted Scott Pruitt in what has been deemed a racing incident. Both cars suffered punctures. More damage was done to Scott Pruitt's Ganassi Lexus. Body and suspension damage. It kept him in pit lane for a prolonged period of time. Max Angelelli inherited the lead only to get a puncture himself. Body work, done to, uh, body work damage done to the car and then it exploded into flames and he is out of this race. Colin Brown is the race leader, but needs to stop again. Mark Goosens is looking in great shape to win this race. And, and uh, Alex Gurney is in good shape for a podium as well. GT leaders all day. It has been the banner engineering duo of Kelly Collins and Paul Edwards and their third driver, Andy Pilgrim today. All three have done a wonderful job. And there are the sister cars in pit lane at the same time. It's been an eventful day for the 06 and the charred remains of the SunTrust 10 Pontiac Riley. They'll be talking about this one for a long time to come. Beautiful day here in Utah, but that's not the way some of the teams will view it on this championship deciding day in the Rolex Sports Car Series. And Brian, I'm sure that's the way Wayne Taylor will see it. I would imagine so, Lee. Wayne just watched the car roll in the garage. And Wayne, I know they're expensive, but they're replaceable race cars. Friends and drivers are not. First of all, how is Max? Yeah, Max is fine. He's obviously very disappointed. Um, you know, to go out like that is really, uh, is really tough. I mean, he was, he was without doubt the quickest guy on the track all day. And, uh, you know, the strategy that the team pulled when you guys asked what we were doing was just perfect. Um, it was really strange that after that incident between the 01 and 99 that they didn't really bring out a yellow because of all the debris and I think the debris got in the back and you know unfortunately for us when he was coming in the tire just uh, tore apart and broke the oil line and set the car on fire. When you look back at this season though you're first as a team owner you had the wins close to the championship is it gratifying what you guys achieved? Well yeah the guys did a great job you know um, we could never have done this without SunTrust Bank, but we wanted to win. You heard him, guys. They wanted to win, and that's what they tried every single weekend to the bitter end. Chris? Well, Brian, it was just over an hour ago. We thought the 99 had made a critical mistake when they did not come in under a caution. Bob, the momentum shifts back your way. It looks like you're in the catbird seat for this championship. Yeah, uh, right now we are high to the bottom of the triplets at home, but uh, I'm, I'm, I'm stoked. I'm kind of holding back my emotions because there's a long way to go. A lot of things can happen, but right this second, we're in pretty good shape. Bob, you've had a chance to look at the replay between the contact of the 01 and the 99. Your thoughts? Just racing. That's all it was, was just racing. No problems. Well, comes down to a championship. You got to do what you got to do. And while we're in that last commercial break, Chris, you just got Bob Stallings' thoughts there. When I just, uh, I just popped out for a quick moment to grab some fresh air and Chip Ganassi was up here having quite a heated discussion with the uh, director of competition, Mark Raffoff. He has deemed that it is a racing incident and Chip was saying, come on, are you kidding me? His front left and our right, our, our right, uh, our left rear and his front right. Anyway, the uh, conversation and discussion is still going on. Brian? Well, Chip Gass Ganassi still having the conversation up there, Tim, but for you guys, I'm sure you saw it very differently than the boys in the 99 car. How did you guys see it? I saw the same video they saw. They hit us from behind. They knew we were coming in that lap. That's just, it's wrong. I won't tell you what we're going to do. Well, there you have it, boys. It's not over till it's over, and that's what we've said all season long. Uh, that has the implication of protest, and we'd hate to see a championship decided that way. Uh, what do you think, Dorsey? I think championship is on the line here today. John Fogarty had the inside lane. Pruitt did move across to defend a little bit. 
and Fogarty realized he had to get in front of the Prua. He was going to have a longer pit stop when they both came in. The only way is to gain track position. And it was set up by a car that both of them were catching, a GT car that was a slower car. And it's the final laps of a championship that you need to win. What do you do? Well, you got to go, don't you? I agree. It's a racing incident. It's a bad way to end a championship, but I don't think that was an intentional in any way hit. You know, we'll take a look at it. I mean, basically, it's here's the, the what I'm talking about. The Porsche has moved everybody over now. Pruitt tightens it up. He gives him very little room. And as a result of that, you're going to see that they bump. Now, that wouldn't have been catastrophic, except for it took out the tires of both cars. You know, and then the, oh, subsequently, when the tires exploded, it blew the championship hopes. Without those tires being down, this would have been a racing incident right. on the race would have been. You move on and Fogarty down there on the inside. That's the dirty part of the racetrack. It's tough to stop. You saw the debris flying. He's on the dusty part of the racetrack and it's tough to stop. I don't think he deliberately took him out. He saw an opportunity. He went to the inside, threw it, defended, and John was going for it. Now, what, here's a crazy scenario. They're, we're getting this all put back together behind the pace car. They're getting it figured out. We've got Chip Ganassi up here going on, and, and they've got that to deal with. But by my calculations, if I'm correct, Scott Pruitt, who went a lap down by doing the repairs after the tire, will be the lucky dog recipient. In other words, he might get that lap back, in which case he would be on the same lap, and the race continues. Well, he's back on pit road. Well, they're going to try to fix that rear spoiler. He's going to have to have some rear downforce. That's what they're doing right here. Brian? Well, they're using some of that adhesive paper to stick that rear in and see if they can get that spoiler raised up a little bit. Here's my question. There are two cars on this team, guys. You heard Tim Keene say, you know what we're going to do? I don't know. Ooh. The old one stays running. The 19 gets involved with the 99. Let's throw some conspiracy at it. Is that what Tim Keene meant? Who knows? We'll find out. Michael Valiente is out there in the 19. Mission Residential Z-Line Designs car back in 18th position on a positive. This really throws out some variables for the likes of Mark Goosens and Colin Brown, who are up in the top three, have stopped on this most recent portion. Can they pick up their first wins of 2007? We'll find out. If you've just joined us, let's fill you in with some of the details of our championship contenders. This was a, an interesting point of the race at our second full course caution. Pruitt dove to pit lane and race leader at that time, John Fogarty, did not. Max Angelelli was quite forceful with Salvador Duran and made his intentions clear about how serious he was about winning this championship. Fogarty on the inside, this is the talking point and it may be an appeal and a protest point. Fogarty on the inside, contact with Pruitt, damage to the bodywork, more importantly, the suspension. And it was drama with Angelelli who inherited the race lead only to catch some of that debris. It cut a tire, damage, perhaps an oil leak, and that's what caused this fire to ignite. It was a dangerous situation, but thankfully, Angelelli was able to walk away from the incident. Very, very dramatic scenes as we bring you up to date with the points as of now. And of course, the 99 is sitting pretty. Alex Gurney, John Fogarty would win this title by 11 points. They came in with just a solitary point advantage over Scott Pruitt. The day is done for Max Angelelli. He is back in the paddock in the transporter. In GT, this is the championship leading car. And I guess shortly will be the winning car, so long as everything goes to plan. Dirk Werner sitting pretty in the GT Championship. Such a shame that Andy Lally had that problem early in the race, because I think this championship also would have gone right down to the final laps, because Andy Lally, Pompelli, RJ Valentine would really have taken the battle to this squad today as well. You remember we sh uh, told you that... Uh, bittersweet story about the Ganassi team losing one of their members, Travis Bickle. There is Travis's widow, Lisa. Uh, Calvin, you and I spoke with her yesterday. And also Travis's folks are here at the track. And they were crossing everything to try and celebrate a championship victory, not only for Travis, but for the Ganassi team. And at the moment, it doesn't look like that's going to happen, Brian. Lisa Bickle standing here in the Ganassi garage. I know you guys did everything to try to bring a victory here. You brought the cookies and everything, but more importantly, the gift of life that Travis gave. I noticed the green bracelet on your wrist. Tell us a little bit about that, Lisa. Um, this is a, a bracelet for Donate Life. Um, it's just a symbol that I wear daily um, so that I can really spread the message of organ donation and really work hard toward um, bringing some positive out of the tragic situation and the loss of Travis. 
and you talk about how good it has been. Lives have been saved everywhere, including on this team, Lee. And one thing we didn't mention at Sonoma when we uh, mentioned that story was that 85 people benefited from Travis Bickle's organ donation. So that was tremendous. And uh, speaking with his parents earlier today, uh, they thanked us for mentioning that and wished the team very well in their pursuit of this championship. We get back to the race at hand, though, and it's looking good for Mark Goosens, isn't it? Perhaps the Riley Matthews car. Ryan Hunter Ray, Goosens, and Jim Matthews. Are they going to be victorious today? That there is Kyle Brannan, and that's what stress looks like. <laughs> yes, one way. He's the engineer of the 99, a two-time championship winning engineer in Toyota Atlantic Racing, a highly regarded man in this paddock and in motor racing in general. Can this car hang on to clinch the championship? The Bob Stallings Gaines Co. organization came into this 2007 season winless. They said, we made too many mistakes over the past two years. We need to eradicate those mistakes just to win a race. But when you get more, you want more. And when they got that first win, they wanted their second win. They now boast seven wins in this season. They want a championship and it's going their way. So far, so good in the closing stages of the 2007 Rolex sports car series. Colin Brown would like to farewell this series on his way to the ARCA Remax Championship next year with a win in 2007 for he and Nick Jonsson. What's Thomas Enger got? He's sitting back there fourth. All these cars in the top five, six, seven, whatever you like to say, are good on fuel, good to the end. This is just an out and out sprint race and we're getting ready to roll. Goosens is quick. He's got the speed in the Pontiac Riley. What has Alex Gurney got sitting in second place? And then Colin Brown and Thomas Enger. Let's go, the race to the finish. Well, you got two of the most aggressive drivers on the planet right behind Fogarty right now. Alex Gurney, excuse me. And I think they're gonna take advantage of the 99 machine immediately. Look at Thomas Enger, deep in the break zone and he gets Colin Brown. Look at Colin though, he tucks back to the inside. That's close, there did they rub? There may have been a touch there. Goosens, Enger. Colin Brown, Alex Gurney back to fourth now. Shane Lewis is in the mix. And there is the 19. The 19 of Michael Valiente is right behind the 99, putting pressure on that championship car. Fogarty is getting gapped here, Dorsey. We have to wonder how healthy is the 99 machine. I keep saying Fogarty, of course, is Alex Gurney behind the wheel right now. I don't think Alex wants any part of any of this. He's pretty safe in the championship, but he doesn't want to get taken up. Scott Pruitt's not far behind. Remember, he got back on the lead lap, but his car is wounded. Chris. The Alex Gurney on the radio right now giving a report to the team on the handling of the 99 machine. He said that right front corner is a bit tweaked, so the car not working as well as it was earlier in the race. He's kind of a sitting duck to all these quicker cars around him. The team just saying, hey, Alex, all you got to do, limp it home. Let's not worry about it. Let's not worry about winning this race. Let's worry about getting the championship. So he's got a bent toe link. He's not going to be able to go up to speed. Now watch Pruitt. Yeah, he can't limp at home. He's got to stay in front of the 01 machine. And Pruitt's car has downforce problems at the back, but we don't think it's got a bent corner, which means it should handle pretty darn good. So several have got by Gurney, but he's trying to keep his composure. We're looking in the background to see how far back Scott Pruitt is. He's at the tail. He's behind the 60 Mike Shank racing car. There's about six in between Gurney. There's Pruitt right there at the back of that pack. The wounded Telmex Ganassi Lexus trying to recover, trying to hold on to this championship and the championship hopes. Well, there goes his rear downforce. You see what they taped on is bent off. It's going to fly off. Will the officials let him run? I would love to see him run. Oh, I'd love to see Chip Ganassi if they bring him in. Yeah, oh boy, don't even go there. Oh, man. I mean, Scott's got a handful of race car, but I also does, you know, Gurney up in front doesn't have a, a, a nice one either. And is the toe link bent enough to where it's going to do damage to that front tire? And yes. guess what car is in front of the 99? It is the sister Ganassi machine. Oh, gosh, don't go there. If he could slow the 99 up, maybe Michael Valiente will. It's all about a team game, isn't it? Key is going to be when they get some clear running here, see who has the rhythm and the pace to try and get this car to the checkered flag. Which car is wounded the most, the 99 or the 01? What has to happen is all the cars between them that are not wounded need to get by the 99 to get Pruitt a chance and for us to see who's going to be able to do what. In the last three races, that Riley Matthews Silver 91 has had a second, a fourth, and a sixth. They could go all the way to the top here. Let's give you some time splits because Gurney is in fifth, Pruitt is in ninth, and there's about three seconds between them. But a whole lot of cars. <laughs> there is, there you see Pruitt. Brian, tell us more. 
Chip Ganassi watches Scott Pruitt circulate and go around the tracks. Chip, two weekends in a row at the very end of the championships, they go away. Are we going to lose this one? And if so, what are you going to do about it? Is there a protest in store? Well, you know, Brian, I think last week the uh, we were on the higher moral ground there at the end of the race. And uh, we'll see today where that puts you, you know. Uh, coming down to the last race is uh, awful tough on uh, a lot of things, but that's why we love racing. One thing Chip Ganassi hates is losing, guys. That doesn't do too much good for his nerves either because he's had some anxious moments. Now, will Ganassi get his guys to go? Oh, the 23 car is spun. That was down, I think, in turn one. We saw one of the cars in the in the picture sliding out there. Will Ganassi send his men down to talk to the guys in front of him and say, hey, this is the championship for us. Will you please let Scott alone? Let him get by. Let him do battle with Gurney. Yeah, will you do us a favor? So that was York Bergmeister. He was one of the cars in between Scott Pruitt and Alex Gurney. So that's one more out of the way for Pruitt's championship campaign. Lee, you think about Gurney having to work his way up, or uh, Pruitt having to work his way up and get around the 99 car. Not only is he going to have to get around the 99 car, but he's going to have to get a car in between he and the 99 car. He just can't stay in front of that car to win this championship. We talk about Pruitt and his determination to try and succeed. Spare a thought for Alex Gurney. He really is in the hot seat, trying to bring this car home for a championship for he, Fogarty, and Bob Stallings. Well, it looks like both of the cars that are wounded, now that the tire temps are up and they've got a feel for the car that they're up to speed, I mean, both cars are holding their own pretty much, so they're not either one damaged so badly that everyone's just going to fly by. And we've got a full course caution. Oh, that's there, is our, the 23. there is our fourth full course caution. And I'd say it's because of the 23 River Tuesday Championship racing car of Bergmeister trapped on the outside of turn one. Boy, this is far from over now. Just three cars separate Scott Pruitt from the gearbox of that 99. But when York spun down there, he got stuck on the outside. There he is. That's a target zone. And if the car truly will not fire, well, you got to move it. You just can't leave him there for the remainder of this race. Bergmeister, the outgoing Daytona prototype champion. Receiving some assistance. The machine fires and he's away. Little pop start. Now he rejoins. Although he'll be down some lap or two. Now, the two cars, as, they shuffle, as the order shuffles through this time, I should say, I correct myself, the one car in between Scott Pruitt and Alex Gurney in terms of the order, because Gurney is fifth, Pruitt is seventh, is a fellow Lexus. Exactly, exactly. And last year here to win that championship, there was a lot of talk between the two teams on helping each other out. Now we're on board with York Bergmeister heading down this long front straightaway doors. So he's breaking for turn one. Bert Frizzell on the outside. Oh, and they get together. Bert spun but kept going. Of course, York spins off here and would not restart. Whew. We're going to catch our breath. We're going to squeeze in a quick commercial break and come back. Don't leave us. There is a championship on the line and it's going to be decided shortly. If you're really into detailed driver stats, in-depth analysis, breaking news, there's only one place to go, and that's the most powerful online team in NASCAR, foxsports.com and speedtv.com. We're back at Miller Motorsports Park under our fourth full-course caution in what has been a very eventful day here in Utah. And the championship, the GT championship, is pretty much all but decided. Paul Edwards, Andy Pilgrim, and Kelly Collins are on their way to their second win this year. Here it is, the 07 Banner Pontiac GXPR. Great day. Well done, guys. Super performance, but the championship will elude them. It's going Dirk Werner's way, so long as it stays as is over the next uh, 15 laps. I don't think that's going to... I don't know. Stay as it is. These last 10, 20... I got the last hour has been just crazy. Getting back to Pruitt's situation, he's seventh position, two positions behind John Fogarty. Getting ahead of John, as Chris mentioned, would not be enough. He needs to go up into the higher points paying position. So his size would really be on Shane Lewis. Fourth position, then get you a two point spread if he was ahead of Gurney. So that's where he needs to get to. So that's a tall order with a damaged race car. And if you look at the two race cars, this one with a little bit of toe in or toe out problem from that contact, I would rather be driving it because you can 
co you know you can cope with that. Scott Pruitt, on the other hand, the back of his car, half of the entire downforce is missing because the body's been ripped off. And this is a relatively quick racetrack. You got a three-quarter mile straightaway, and then all these corners to deal with. So I think Scott's car is the worst of the two, and his job the bigger because of it. Well, it's Alex Gurney's behind the wheel in the 99. He's heading for his first professional championship at this level. For John Fogarty, he's been there before. Let's take you back. Two times a Toyota Atlantic champion. And his most recent one coming in 2004. He clinched it at Mazda Raceway, Laguna Seca. Two years previous, he was the champion again. And for a Californian boy, that was a terrific result. So he knows what it's like to win a championship at this level. For Alex Gurney, it's a foreign feeling. And for it to go down to the wire like this, this is really nerve-wracking stuff for Gurney, for Fogarty, for Bob Stallings, for Kyle Brannon, for everybody involved. Can they do it? With statistics like this, the Bob Stallings Gainsco Auto Insurance team are just hoping to cap it off with a championship. Look at that. Ten poles, nine straight. It's a Grand Am Daytona prototype record. 563 laps led. That was before today, of course. Nine individual track records and seven wins. It has been a superb season. Keep in mind, they came into 2007 winless. So what a way to go. All right, ramp it up. Get ready. This is the run to home. And a championship will be decided as of now. Mark Goosen sees the green flag with a clear track ahead. Thomas Enger looking to gain position. Colin Brown, what's he got left? And how about the Southern Motorsports Lexus of Shane Lewis and Eric Lux? They sit fourth at the moment. Could they round out the year with a podium? Clear track ahead, but he's got his mirrors full of two very aggressive young drivers. Thomas Enger, Colin Brown. Shane Lewis could be in the good shape. <laughs> Shane Lewis is in a great position right here. These three guys in front of him, ultra aggressive, and we've seen what happens when around this place when you try to get inside. Woo. In Shane's younger days, he used to be a bull rider. That'll put him in good stead here. <laughs> it's going to get rough. The 39 Crown Royal Special Reserve Fab Car is not in this race. It is a lap car. Richard Antonucci behind the wheel. He's down in 13th. He was very fast, though. Laid down one of the fastest lap of the race if not the fastest we haven't quite got that information in front of us right now but earlier in the race he was the fastest man on the racetrack and really that team paid dearly for running the car out of fuel in the early laps this car the three southern motorsports shane lewis car this morning warm up right before the race had an altercation on track it took off the whole front end of the car the guys at southern great job getting back together and if they can just stick where they are and great job uh, eric lux who stepped into that daytona prototype to partner up with shane lewis good job kept the car clean got it back in one piece and handed it over to the team's number one driver what's happening back in the pack gurney is still fifth pruitt is still back there fighting with oswaldo negri trying to get through and there's some lap traffic in between those guys so the championship chase is still very much on with 13 to go. Look at Antonucci, he is flying. He's really got a lot of speed in the 39 Crown Royal car. And you know, Shane Lewis, he does, if he knows that, if they tell him that that car is not part of the fray, it would be smart just to let him go because then he'll mix it up with the guys in front and maybe tear something up. I'm watching this battle right now, guys, and I'm watching Fogarty begin to close on the 19, that other Chip Ganassi entry in front of him. And I'm thinking, is the crew saying, look, John, as long as Scott's not coming up from behind, maybe we shouldn't try to go past another one of those Chip Ganassi cars. Well, if I was the drive, if I was driving, that's what I'd be thinking. I'd get behind this 19 car and uh, leave myself a little room for anything that might suddenly go wrong. <laughs> you know what I mean? Lap traffic further back. It's Matt Al Haddiff in the Siegel Sport BMW, Mamo Gidley. Then it's a car that is in the race. It's Oswaldo Negri in the 60 Mike Shank racing car, and then immediately behind is Scott Pruitt. Pruitt's got Bert Frizzell right behind him. That's his old championship winning car that Bert Frizzell is driving. So Scott Pruitt may get a little bit of help from his friends here. The fellow Lexus runners. He's got one behind him and one in front right now. And look at Mark Goosen's go. That car, the 91 car, has been very fast at all of the sessions that we've seen here. And I think right now that Goosen being in front like that, he's got all he needs. And as Chris correctly pointed out earlier, Pruitt not only needs to catch Gurney to win this championship, but he needs to go ahead of him by a, a car at least, because when you get back there, if they're finishing fifth and sixth, there's only one point in the difference in terms of points awarded. 
And Gurney and Fogarty came into this championship decider with a one-point advantage. Saw the 21 Pontiac off the road. Now that's no consequence to anybody except for the fact that it brings all those stones and things on the racing surface. And we've seen so many punctures around this racetrack during the last week. Well, the 11 Samax car with Thomas Enger behind the wheel started the year with a second place. Is it about to finish the year with a second place? In GT, the 07 of Paul Edwards is fending off a challenge here from the 85 of Dominic Van Barker. And this is surprising because it doesn't really need to happen. The uh, Pontiac boys doing a great job setting the pole and leading most of this whole race don't have a chance to win this championship. So uh, it surprises me that the Porsche wants to get up in there and mix it up. Dirk Werner in the 87 sits third in class and he will win this championship in 12 laps. So long as he stays where he is and nothing goes astray there with him. Emil Asentato sits fourth in class in the 69 Speed Source Mazda. And then Darren Law has jumped aboard the 17 Doncaster Porsche. The reason why? He is trying to win that Porsche Worldwide Cup. Darren Law has driven so many Porsches. He gets yeah. in anything he can get in. He goes in there and gets some points for that Porsche Cup. Hasn't caught a break all weekend long. Had a great run going here yesterday in the Corley Challenge race. That went away at the end. And uh, obviously they had problems earlier in this one with a very fast car, the 58 machine. But this would be a great story for, for Dominic Farnbacher. They really haven't caught a break all year. Started off the season while well, at a podium finish in Mexico City. But since that time, just can't seem to get their lucky break. But right now, putting the pressure on the 07 car. Nothing to lose. They're going to be going for it. Right. The championship car, the team car is safe back there. It's going to get the champion. Now, why not go up here and try to mix it up with this? The Pontiac's been really strong all weekend long. This is the closest we've ever seen them. A lot of encouraging results and feedback from the 2007 season for the Banner Engineering boys moving ahead into 2008. Yet to confirm the driver lineup. Will Tim Lewis Jr. be back? Will Leighton Reese continue to drive? Or is he going to wind back and stand aside for a younger driver with a longer career ahead? Well, that's all to find out in the coming weeks and months during the off season. There's going to be quite a lot of changes next year. That's for sure. After this season, it's been a fantastic season. It's not yet over. Nothing's changed here. This is the 99 of Alex Gurney, still maintains a fifth position. There's second Enger, third is Colin Brown. It's a lap car of Richard Antonucci. Fourth is the red and white PLP Lexus Riley of Shane Lewis. The 19 of Michael Valiente is a lap car, then the fifth place car. And champion elect Alex Gurney and John Fogarty, who's on the pit box with the boss there, Bob Stallings who is pleading with the officials to say the 19 car is a lapped car. It's not in the championship. It's not in the race. Please don't let it interfere. As look at this. Pruitt is trying to get by Matt Alhadoff, who is a lapped car. No favors done there. Bergmeister's coming back on the inside. It's a scramble. Look at this. Locking up Oswaldo Negri down into the turn where Pruitt got hit. On board with Alhadoff. And York Bergmeister did a really nice job there. He didn't force the issue. All of the drivers were told in the drivers' meeting this morning, don't affect the outcome of this championship. Give those boys a little bit more room. And I think York Bergmeister certainly did that with Scott Pruitt there. No doubt about it. Scott Pruitt did what he had to do. He put it down in there in kind of harm's way, but he has no choice about it. Everybody else gave him the room needed to make that required uh, non-crash, I should say. Right, with 10 and a half to go, it's becoming a little more clear now for Pruitt. He's got Oswaldo Negri immediately ahead in the Mike Shank Racing Lexus. Can he get by him and get closer to Alex Gurney? And you saw right there, Scott Pruitt, how loose it is. Watch the back of the car as it moves. It's leaving black rubber marks off the back tires because it's fully loose with no downforce at the back. Doing comparable lap times, though, to Alex Gurney in the 247 range. Chris? Well, lots of talk down here at the Gaines Co. camp. Bob Stallings pleading with officials, telling him, hey, let's not let anybody come get involved in this uh, championship that isn't been in the 01 or the 99 car. So really trying to talk, you know, are these Lexus cars getting in the way? Is the 19 car getting in the way? He's got uh, one official down here. A couple other have showed up. So uh, Bob Stallings trying to keep this uh, playing field real fair. Mamo Gidley's come into the mix. However, he is not in this race. He is down in 14th position overall, not on the lead lap in the yellow Kodak Easy Share Doran. Tense closing moments. Can the seven-time race-winning car convert it to a championship? What's the blue and white Telmex car got there in the background? 
There's a lot of work to be done in 10 laps. There is. This is going to be the longest 10 laps of Alex Gurney's career. Unbelievable stuff, unbelievable pressure. There you see the 19 car getting a little wide. Now it's difficult for Alex Gurney. What decision do you make? Do you force the issue? Do you try and throttle back a little bit? Just gap that car door. See, what would you do in this situation? Championship on the line. You know, you got to run hard. You got Memo Gidley right behind him now, too. And although that car's not in the race, you know, for this, this thing, he's, you know, Gurney's got a car that's wounded. It's got some toe problems on the front from the wreck, so he's not at 100% efficiency right now. The 19 car, that's a danger area for it. The final 10 laps of the 2007 racing season in the Rolex Sports Car Series. Never been a repeat winner in the Daytona prototype class. Does that trend continue with Gurney and Fogarty getting their first DP title? And Pruitt is not that far behind, but I gotta be honest with you guys, I just don't think that the Telmex car has enough body work and a suspension and things it needs to get the job done. Downforce all tore off the back. Scott, though, has been on top of his game around this place all weekend long. He has, and he's going to be adjusting to this car door so he can make some subtle adjustments inside the cockpit. The key will be that tire wear. Does he burn the tires off this car with just 10 laps to go? Calvin, it's the conversation we had at dinner last night about Scott Pruitt and how all of us really respect him so much as a driver. We've seen him drive everything from stock cars, open wheel cars, sports cars, and all of that varied experience. He's going to look back on that now and remember what that GTO car was like when it was wounded, the Trans Am car, the Winston Cup car, the kart car. He's going to remember those cars when they had problems and reach back and say, what can I pull out of my bag of tricks to help work my way through this? Race control has said, show the blue flag to car 19 to inform him there are faster cars behind. Michael Valiente knows that all too well. Porsche are on the verge of clinching the GT manufacturer's title and the GT driver's title. And we'd like to thank our friends at Porsche for bringing us this final segment all the way to the checkered flag with no commercial interruptions. Here's the car that is the topic of discussion, the 19 of Valiente, the second Ganassi car, the Z-Line Designs Mission Residential Entry, Young Dane Cameron almost got his start here last year in Daytona Prototypes. Got it here today with Michael Valiente. He is the star Mazda points leader. Great experience for him, but it's his more experienced teammate, Michael Valiente, who's behind the wheel with Gurney all over him. Valiente seems to be struggling a little bit with his car's handling through some of these corners, Dorsey. And that is going to result in a slowing of the pace for Fogarty and maybe Pro can close in. There you see him in the background. Well, racing is all about one thing. It's called problem solving. And both the drivers, Gurney and back there, Pruitt, are doing just that right now. They're both trying to solve the problem of how to get the most of their wounded cars. The 19 car, the problem's being solved there by the officials. It's being told, get out of the way or we'll do something with you. Lee, you just went to a driver's school last week. What does that mean, mate? <laughs> Blue flag. <laughs> you probably saw that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> You know that one. Uh, it, Here we go. It just brought it to my attention as to why I'm a broadcaster and not like you guys as a racer. As they head down into turn one, Pruitt continues the chase. Negri is in the mix. And we just got a report to us. We show you the points as of now that it wasn't only the 99 complaining about get this 19 out of the way. Apparently, Mamo Gidley did as well. But that's kind of interesting because Mamo's a lapped car himself. <laughs> uh, well, that flag that you're seeing being waved, the passing flag, is an advisory flag. It tells the driver, hey, you know, we really would like to see you pull over. It is not yet a demand. There we see the pass. That's uh, Oswaldo Negri on Gidley, but that's not for position, okay? Now the next one is for position, because Oswaldo Negri will not stop for every anybody, and he won this race last year with Mark Patterson. He will be trying to do that again. That's tough work, considering Goosen, Zenga, Brown, Lewis, they're up in the top four positions, but Oz is doing everything he can in this Mike Shank Racing Lexus to get by Alex Gurney, the car immediately ahead. Of course, this car has suffered about three times now. Alternator belts falling off of it, so it hasn't been a smooth run. The guys in the pit stack, the Mike Shanks has been doing a really good job putting it back together and keeping it out there, so they want their good position. We know Oz is very aggressive. He seems to be a little bit quicker than Gurney right now. 
Justin Wilson, the man who's second in the Champ Car World Series at the moment, of course, the third driver in this car today, along with Mark Patterson, who's recovering from that bad bicycling accident. As you mentioned before, Cal, we wish him well in his recovery. It's been a bit of a tough slog for Mark this weekend, just to get by with the driving duties with a very sore left shoulder. He was a lucky boy. He said he was going over 45 miles an hour downhill on his bicycle and uh, had a car turn across him, took a major tumble. Really skinned himself up pretty badly, but great that he's okay and uh, here competing again this weekend. This is for position. This is for position. 60 and 99. The 19 in front, don't worry about that. We're focused on these two cars, these three cars. This is where it's going to get interesting with eight and a half laps to go. Look at this. Pruitt is getting ever closer to that 99 machine. Now just one car. Ozzy Negri between he and the guy who he's going to try and wrestle this championship away from. And the 19 has not heated any of the flags. He is, in fact, holding the group up, and Pruitt is coming. There's some rubbish in the air intake area at the front of the Telmex 01 car for Scott Pruitt. It doesn't seem to be affecting him. <laughs> Are we going to see a desperate move from Negri? Will he do the big inside dive? on Alex Gurney heading down into one. We're about to find out as they start the drag race one more time. I think one thing that Scott Pruitt has is a lot of respect in this paddock here, and I think all of the drivers out there will give him a little bit of room, Dorsey, and let him go after this championship this afternoon. That's one thing about it. He's like the Mark Martin of, uh, of road racing. He's one of the elder guys. He's proven his worth, and he drives you clean. You should do the same to him. It was heartbreak last weekend in Chicago Land Speedway. In the closing moments of that race as Scott Dixon, one of Chip's drivers, kissed goodbye the title and a million dollars. Is it going to be heartbreak again here for the Ganassi organization? We're going to know in just a few laps time. Oh, now there's oil. That's an oil down. Another Porsche engine failure. That's the third TRG yeah. car to let go today. Very uncharacteristic. Here we go. Inside, here we go. Alex Gurney and Michael Valiente. Alex is on the outside through this right-hander. Valiente doesn't give him any respect. He, does, he could have just let it go right there and does not do so. It is close. It is tight now. This is where it's getting interesting. I think you just saw what you needed to know about the 19. He's going to keep it like this. Oh, look at this. Inside. Through goes Oswaldo Negri on Alex Gurney, and Pruitt is the next one in the line. Does he go for it on the he inside? Does. He, he touches it. He, he rubs him up. Bergmeister slices down the inside. Unsettles Gurney and gets through, and a car moves through. The reaction from the Gaines Co pit, and there's Chip Ganassi. Now, don't forget, Pruitt needs some help. He needs another car between he and Gurney to get that point spread. But he got it. Didn't he get it with the 61 going yeah, through? Yeah, right now. And Bill Borchella going through. What is going on with Gurney? It looked like he'd slowed a little bit through those previous few corners. Pruitt took advantage. Points as of now, Scott Pruitt would be in the lead of this championship. There are enough cars on the lead lap between he and the 99 to clinch it for Ganassi. Dramatic scenes here in Utah. I wonder if he got offline, Dorsey. It may be pickup. He's trying to get the car, get those tires scrubbed, but it looked like he'd slowed before that. There was a real gap there, and Ozzy just blew by him, and Pruitt took advantage in the next corner as well. And when Ozzy blew by, it de de definitely put him to the outside. Yeah. He was a sitting duck for Pruitt, even though he did bump. I mean, this is it. This is for the championship. Let's go. Here's the replay. Let's see it again. He's slow, Pruitt has the momentum, and you know, Scott Pruitt said, you did it to me, you're going to get it back, the championship is on the line. You see all those marbles on the outside, that's what we're talking about in terms of pickup. You get those on the tyres, you really have no grip, it's like being on ice for a few corners. View from Bergmeister's car, Pruitt immediately ahead, Gurney the next one in line. This is earlier, in fact. Gurney slows there, run. Gurney slows immediately, you see him? Negri goes by his Pruitt's move. Here's your first loosen up bump. Gurney looked like he had a problem a couple of corners before that. Chris? Well, we've seen Bob Stallings lobbying with the officials down here before the incident. Now you just saw the contact there. Bob, what are you hearing from Alex? Well, we, we, there's two things going on. Number one, obviously the 19 car is like four or five laps down. And every time we have been in this position, race control has told us to slow down, move over and get out of the way. We have asked them for 10 laps to do the same thing they did to us to the 19 car. They've refused to do that. You'll have to ask them why. Then the old one car after that last episode came in behind Alex and purposefully hit him. 
I'm, I'm very, very uptight about that. It's definitely not fair. Bob Stallings, big reaction down here from pit lane, but we've still got time on the clock. A lot of emotion, as you can easily understand. Points as of now, Pruitt would have a two-point advantage over the gurney Fogey combination. Another look at this. You really need to key on the fact that Gurney has slowed up. One car's by, yeah. here's Scott. Scott r roughs him up, and lifts him, but I don't know that it's an intentional deal. Both of them get through there. You know, paybacks are what they are. <laughs> well, got you can't too. afford to wait. If a car is wounded or he's a little bit offline, you've got to stick it in there. I mean, <laughs> this it's is make it. or break time. Right, this there is, is the no championship. Tomorrow. And you're talking about five, seven laps to go. What do you do? You go for it, always. It's been hard to leave this enthralling battle, but let's not forget about Mark Goosens, who leads the race. Thomas Enger is still second. Colin Brown is third. Shane Lewis is fourth. Negri is fifth. And then Pruitt is in Just sixth quick, place. Just real quick, Chip is... Uh... Chip is going to be walking away here. Chip, a little turnabout is fair play there, a little bit of rubbing out there, or just clean racing? No, I mean, he, he he just said he didn't know what was going on. The 99 slowed down a lot there. He slowed down dramatically, so I don't know what was that was all about. Well, they're racing to the bitter end, guys, and a little rubbing. We've seen it all day long. No reason to expect we won't see it to the checkers. That could have been a missed gear shift. It could have been a missed brake pedal. It could have been anything. You're never going to find out about what it was. Well, he moved to the left side of the track. It was like he was almost attempting to get out of the way of Negri and maybe just miscalculated how close Pruitt was behind him. I don't know. Any Strange. little glitch like that, you can, you know, you feel something, that you miss a gear, do whatever, you try to get out of the way. Like, you're right. Gurney moved to the left, slowed up, and that was what left him open for Negri. And then Pruitt forced the issue because you have to. Yep. Five and a half laps to go. On board the Ruby Tuesday Championship Racing Porsche. Bergmeister is in sixth place. Well, back to the second place battle. Yeah. <laughs> These yeah. guys still going at it pretty hard. Oh, it's for just the podium. <laughs> this is great stuff. Look at Colin Brown. He is driving the wheels off that machine. This may be his final Grand Am race. Moving on to the NASCAR world. And look at the 39 car. He's down a little bit, but he has tremendous speed. He did, in fact, set the fastest lap on lap 52 of this event. Richard Antonucci, he's going to split Colin Brown from Thomas Enger. This is a man who has won two races in the IPS no series this year. Way. Listen not. to this. Listen to this. There is a drive through penalty being handed down to Scott Pruitt for avoidable contact. I cannot believe what I'm hearing or seeing at all. How does that differ from what happened with the 99 on the 01? It doesn't. It doesn't. Neither one except, went off the racetrack. Except one of them didn't get a penalty and one's about to. I, I don't I don't I don't agree with that. I mean uh, certainly the officials have got to make some tough calls, but I think at this stage of the game championship on the line, you let the drivers decide it unless it gets really ugly. Now here's the thing all over again. We know what happens. Here's Scott coming up. Something's gone with wrong with Gurney's car. He roughs him up a little bit there. No problem. Now, neither car spins. Both of them go on. It happened before. No penalty before. Why am I getting one now? Wow. I'd hate to see this championship decided that way. That would be very disappointing. Well, both of these team owners, of course, are going No, There's no winner here as far as... The emotion goes with the thing. I mean, it's. I, I just disagree with this penalty vehemently. There was something wrong with Alex Gurney on those few corners doors. He slowed down. He moved to the left side. The 60 car just went. There was something going on there. We've got to speak to Alex and to really understand what was going on in his head or with the race car at that point in time. But, you know, Pruitt had the momentum. The championship's on the line. He's going to tuck it to the inside. There was a body rub. He didn't take him out. He didn't turn him around. I don't think you should call a, a drive through penalty on Scott Pruitt. You know, on the first time around, there's Pruitt. Inside Oswaldo Negri, that pass was for position, but I guess it's null and no, void now when he's going to come in for a drive through. Well, had there been a penalty on the contact the first time around, then I would say you have to give the penalty here. But since there was no right. penalty on the right. first time around, this one's ridiculous. They really, seem, they really seem to have eased up on these drive-through penalties. In the beginning of the season, you just looked at someone and they pulled you down pit lane. Then they let the guys go out a little bit. This is sports car racing. The fans love it. You're going to trade some pain as long as you don't just take someone out. And I always thought the call was going to be if you turn someone around, then you're probably going to get a drive-through. If you bump and grind and you get down the inside and you both continue, then that's just good racing. Well, guess what has not happened? He didn't come in. Scott didn't come in. I don't think you're going to see Scott come in because why would he? What's going to happen if he comes in? Let's go back to the Ganassi camp. 
of Ganassi climbing back on the box. And the last person that he wants to talk to is me right now, Chip. But, I mean, the way you see this penalty, I mean, this is, I, I can't even, I'm speechless. I don't even know what uh, is going on in your mind about this penalty. Is Scott going to come in or no? I don't know anything about a penalty. No one's saying to me what penalty. Yeah, the guys up top are talking about a drive through penalty for avoidable contact on that move with the 99. I didn't see it. Boys down here right now, they don't seem to know about it. I don't know if they're just going to uh, play like they don't know and ignore it and see if it goes away or what. Well, Brian, uh, allegedly, he's got one more opportunity to serve that penalty or they're going to stop scoring him. Okay, but so what? So what? I mean, they can fight about this in court. They're going to anyway. But if he goes on right now, he's got something to fight about because yeah. he's going to finish in front. If he pulls in, he's done. If you come down pit lane, they can't give you the time back. Right now, if he maintains track position ahead of Gurney, they can maybe fight it afterwards. But I don't think you should go do burnouts at the end and get on the roof of the car in front of the <laughs> That might be We've seen uh, that this once. This is just week. a shame. I, I just hate to see this. It's been such a tremendous season, tremendous race. I don't want to see it come down to this. No, nobody does. And, but like, like I say, it's not it's, what Scott's being told to do is the only option in my book. I mean, so if they quit scoring and, and this is an arguable point, period. Tremendous day, though, for the Riley Matthews organization. Remember, this is the car that Jimmy Johnson started the year out with at the Rolex 24. Antonucci, meanwhile, even though he's a lap car, he's just carving them up. <laughs> That's the second place car he just brought by. He's, everybody's going, who is it? Oh, look at the sideways through there. <laughs> Dirt tracking it through the, they, they call those corners the attitudes. He certainly had some going through there. And here's Colin Brown. Try and take advantage of that. <laughs> this has just gone crazy. This has been a crazy race, for sure. So it's Goosens, Enger, and Brown, the top three, will stand on the podium for the race if it remains the same, which is highly unlikely <laughs> if things go as planned and to, to form from today, that's for sure. The black flag and the number 01, is it being displayed again as Scott Pruitt comes past the start-finish line? We will see this time around. The report we just got is that he's got one more chance to obey that stop-go penalty, that drive-through penalty, Otherwise, they will stop scoring him. And yes, we can see it from our commentary that's position. He's not coming in. He's staying out. But that's by order. I guarantee you that is by order. He's been told there's the black flag, car number. There's no mistake. Scott knows what the situation is. And like I said before, what choice does he have? He has none whatsoever. Throw the thing away. It's thrown away anyway if you go by this ruling. Pruitt maintains his seventh place. Fo uh, rather, Gurney is behind him. Frizzell is ninth, and Ian James for Mike Shank Racing has worked his way up into the top ten. The final four laps of the 2007 season. It will be a first victory for Riley Matthews. What a day for those boys. That is huge. I mean, they have just come on gangbusters this last handful of races. And what a battle we're seeing here. This is going to go down to the wire for sure. Colin Brown wants to go out with a bang. He'd love to see victory. Unbelievable that the championship winning team, Chrome Racing, have not come back with even a single victory this year, but they made some changes. They switched the combination, the package, and that's always tough. They're gonna to bring the 0-1 in. I just heard that Jip Ganassi said, okay, enough is enough. I'll bring the 0-1 car in. They're gonna fight it. They're gonna fight this thing. They deserve to fight it. But Scott Pruitt will bring the car in this lap. They've acknowledged the penalty, and the 0-1 will drive down pit lane. Nice way for the year to finish for Peter Barron and his team, the Samax organization. They finished the year the way they started it with a second, if Enger remains where he is right now. Goosens has a four and a half second lead over Enger, incidentally, so it's comfortable up front. Shane Lewis will be delighted. That's the best result for the Southern Motorsports car in season 2007, sitting in fourth. And Bergmeister has got the Ruby Tuesday Porsche up into the top five. What a great run for Shane Lewis. Eric Lux sharing the car for the first time this weekend. He's really done a great job as well on his debut. So just a great job by the Southern Motorsports team. They don't have the resources of the big boys, but they certainly do a, a lot with very little. They're looking for sponsorship, and their day didn't start out good. Like I said, a big crash this morning. They had to rebuild the front end. This team never gives up. They really, really just get after it. And this is just hats off to them for this great finish. Always nice to finish the season on a high. Absolutely. Yeah. Shane gives it 100% every time he jumps in the car. Doesn't sort of have the star power of some of the bigger names, but he's gradually working towards that status with just a great job every time he gets behind the wheel. Hard working sports car driver, will drive anything, any class. 
and always gives it his best. Tremendous performance as we work our way back. Good scrap going on here. Terry Borcella, the inaugural Daytona prototype champion in the 59. He's got the Brumos machine up there in sixth and hassling Jörg Bergmeister, last year's Daytona prototype champion, for a top five position for the 59. That'd be a nice way for that car to go out. Yeah, because that car had to change an engine. It blew up early this morning, unfortunately, which means it starts at the back, and here comes Scott Pruitt on pit lane. This is a sad pitch. It was a sad day right here. Like this. Not when it's... It's not apples for apples, is it? Well, it is apples for apples. It's the same. It's the same contact, but it's a different, uh, a different ruling. Serves his penalty begrudgingly. Like I say, it's normally about a four-hour engine change to change one of those Porsche engines in the back of the Brumos car, the 59. They only had an hour and a half, hour 40 minutes from when it blew up to when this race started. So all hands on deck. They got the job done, and that's a great job by the Brumos boys. Imagine the, imagine, the, imagine the emotion, though, Dorsey, of Scott Pruitt driving that pit lane. He has driven a perfect race here today. I mean, just on the money, fast. The car was good. A couple of incidents, and uh, there's got to be a tough tough pit lane <laughs> to drive down. Not for this man, Mark Goosens. And we've watched him all year long. We, we really like to watch the goose when he's on the loose, and he's going to come good today. And that's good for that team. They really struggled early on. Jim Matthews and yep. that whole crew, and they stuck it out, too. And what and a way to go out of the year. Ryan Hunter, Hunter Ray, Riley. too. I mean, what about him? Talk about coming back. Got that ride with Ray Hall Letterman. Had some great performances there. Clinched the Rookie of the Year championship. Only done half the season. And then to finish off this year with a win would be tremendous. All right, folks. For yourself sitting at home in your lounge room, it's time for you to make the decision yourself. I'm going to show a replay of both incidents between the 0-1 and the 99. And of course, the first incident was between John Fogarty on the right of your screen and Scott Pruitt in the 01. There's contact on the rear left of the 01, front right of the 99. There it is. And it created two punctures. Front right for John Fogarty, left rear. Now here's Pruitt on Alex Gurney. Front to rear contact, so slightly different scenario, but the result was the same. Change of position there. Gurney goes wide. No damage to either car in this instance, but and neither car spun out. You know, both cars were able to continue in both incidents. So the wounded Telmex 01 Lexus continues. But it drops Scott Pruitt back down into 10th position. Final laps, less than two remaining. And two champions, two fresh champions in the Rolex series will be crowned. Let's not forget in the GT class, Paul Edwards, great job. Super performance from the young, young GM factory driver. Pole and dominated this race along with Kelly Collins and Andy Pilgrim. They knew it was a long shot coming into today. 15 points was the spread. They knew that that was too much to make up unless both the guys they were racing for in the championship had adversity. Sadly, if you've tuned in late, Andy Lally and RJ Valentine, who have been superb this season, the TRG Porsche just let go. It uh, didn't get them there, and they retired very early in this race. There's Dominic Farnbacher, second in GT, and that is the sister Farnbacher Lowell's car to Dirk Werner and Bryce Miller, who Werner is on the way to his first Rolex Series championship. Young man with a huge future, won the German Porsche Carrera Cup last year, winning the Rolex GT Series this year. Good stuff for Werner. Of course, this is Farnbacher on screen right now. He's a nice young kid, and... Uh just a pleasure to see him do well and clinch this championship. Wonderful championship. I mean, it's been great to see the 07 a little bit closer in the points coming into this race, but they'll finish off the season on a high and they'll certainly come back as a strong force next season. Speaking of Porsche, just uh, quickly, uh, and a man who has a long association with Porsche, and particularly uh, PD at Barber, Porsche driving experience for many, many years, Doc Bundy is not doing so well at the moment. He's currently in hospital. Uh, Doc, we hope you recover from your situation. And uh, all of your friends here in the Rolex Sports Car Series wish you well and a speedy recovery. Yeah, think it'll be me. Chris, what do you have? Well, just came back down to the Farnbacher Lowell's crew. Lots of hugs and kisses down here. Everybody kind of shaking hands, saying what a great job. It looks like Dirk Werner's going to grab this championship. So uh, everybody thinking that this thing is their way today. Relatively... Uh, you know, undramatic fashion this season, Dirk has done it. Just uh, a lot of consistency, and we once again saw that today. And no one hugly keen too hard, because that <laughs> collarbone might pop out. <laughs> and we should Chris Neville did. Yeah, we should give a shout-out to our, our friend and colleague, Chris Neville, who has been reporting wounded today. He broke three ribs several days ago in a uh, 
clumsy go-kart accident, we'll say. <laughs> but I tell you what, he has soldiered on like we've never seen hey, before, and he's worked Lee, the entire day. He's done very, Lee, very come well. Come on, Lee, come on. we got to tell the truth. Brian Till ran me over with the rental car. You're going to give me a lot of trouble <laughs> with my wife. <laughs> well, well done, mate. It's been a terrific effort. Likewise for Mark Goosens, who will see the white flag this time around. What a feeling for Bill Riley. This is first year for this team with this car. Remember, the association with Wayne Taylor and SunTrust Racing, they went out on their own. The 61 has run off, but Frizzell has got some problems to deal with in the AIM Autosport car. But this is super. We always like to see new and fresh winners in the Rolex series. Enger will take Samax to a podium as well, and Colin Brown and Nick Johnson have given it their all to stand on the podium in the last race of the year as well. And Antonucci is just proving a point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he is, isn't he? He's coming back. That Fab car is certainly going to be a force to be reckoned with next year. They've got some other changes as well. It has been revamped a little bit through the course of this year, which has been allowed, allowed within the regulations. And next year, we're going to see a flood of new bodywork designs and some changes underneath the skin as well. And speaking of those changes, remember Proto Auto LLC, the new company formed with Crone and the Lola organization. Jeff Hazel will no longer be the team manager at Crone Racing. He's going to be concentrating more on the Proto Auto side of things. And Dave Brown will step up to be the new team manager there. So changes happening in the off-season. Stay tuned on speedtv.com throughout the off-season for all the testing times and all the news on the Rolex Sports Car Series. We've got a replay of what happened to Bert Frizzell. Dorse, see if you can decipher this. Is it going to be pretty straightforward or a little more complex? I saw it a long way off, so I'm not sure what... Oh, a little congestion here. Oh, contact. I think the six might have gotten the six, back. Uh, Ian James. Ian James got in the back and uh, turned to 61. Was Bert running slow, though, on the inside there, I think? Well, he was trying to get inside a couple GT cars, so I think he was offline and happened to be slow, but... He took a little shot as a result. Could be a racing incident. It was pretty congested getting into that corner, that's for sure, with four cars. What a run for this man. Mark Goosens, been knocking on the door so many years in sports car racing, and this is going to be a big win for him. Just a great boost for the whole team. Under discussion whether Jim Matthews will be back next year. Certainly everything is leaning towards him returning. Mark would love to be behind the wheel once again. Oh. Alongside him, Thomas Enger getting very wide there through the attitude corners, trying to make up that last little bit of ground here on the last lap. Jim Matthews, Ryan hunter Ray, and Mark Goosens will be our seventh different Daytona prototype winner in season 2007. The Pontiac-powered Riley. The silver bullet has got them there for sure been a spirited run by the boys behind them and we're about to crown two champions what a moment for Alex Gurney and John Fogarty and Bob Stallings coming into this season winless going out as champions in dramatic style this race is going to be talked about for quite some time but we congratulate Riley Matthews they do it in the final race of the year the Sun Chaser 1000 Goosens, Hunter Ray and Matthews they do it in Utah and a new winner in the Rolex series it's a good chase on this. here for second. Dominic Farnbacher is not letting Paul Edwards have it all his own way. Nothing between these two boys as they stretch it home. Farnbacher Lowell's are going to clinch the team championship and the driver's championship. And they would like to steal the last race of the year away from Banner Engineering. There's a good three parts of this lap left here. So <laughs> Farnbacher's going to be pushing hard. Will there be any traffic in the equation? Paul Edwards has been so fast in this car around here. Pole sitter by over a second a lap at the races. Coming down to the final bit, and there's a Porsche on his tail. Looks pretty clear ahead of him. And I wonder how that gap came down so dramatically in this last lap or so, because it looked like he had about a two or three second gap, and that is closed dramatically here. Been a very steady, calculated, and methodical run from the 87 of Dirk Werner, Bryce Miller, and Wolf Hensler to steer Werner towards his first Rolex GT championship. Pontiac came here knowing that if they had any chance for the championship, yep. they'd first have to win the race. And look at who's leading. All day long, Paul Edwards, Kelly Collins, great job. As we wait Andy for these, these boys to come home, Dorse, we congratulate Enger and Brown. They will stand on the podium. Shane Lewis got his fourth place. Bergmeister held out Terry Borcella for fifth place. Ian James grabbed seventh. Alex Gurney finished eighth to clinch the championship for Bob Stallings and Gaines Co Auto Insurance. Pruitt finished a position behind, and then Oswaldo Negri in 10th position.
As we look at Edwards, as, as you so often can, look at a championship season and think about what if. There's so many events they could have back and change the strategy a little bit or just have a little bit more luck. The championship could have been theirs. The most undulating section on this four and a half mile track is now out of the way for the final time. The closing corners for Paul Edwards, second victory of the year, and it will be the third for Banner Engineering. Just letting the 36 of Nick DeMeo know that he's coming through and he's got pressure. <laughs> he hasn't won this race just yet. Nope, not yet. He's got a little problem in front of him here. Yeah, cut yeah, me here we he go, he's wide! He's on the marbles! No way! Oh. Unbelievable! No far back! Oh, no! And he's still going to win it. He's going to get it. Can you believe it? This race has been unbelievable. Look at this. <laughs> oh, my gosh. This has been kooky. This has been oh. off the chart. Paul Edwards does it. That Second win of the end. year for he, Kelly Collins, and Andy Pilgrim. I was about to say earlier, can we get anything else happen? Well, there's yes. the answer. Well, wait till, uh, wait till these guys get back to the pits and there's something else might happen. Oh, my goodness. A lap car, last lap, one turn to go, and the championship thing. Oh, this has been nutty. Speaking of championship, it's going to go to that car there, the 87 of Dirk Werner and Bryce Miller. Wolf Hensler was drafted in as the third driver. And there is the Farnbacher Lowell's team. Celebration about to explode. Superb performance from the marquee jet Porsche drivers. Let's have a replay of that Dominic Farnbacher, Paul Edwards and Nick DeMeo incident. Look at Edwards. He's on the marbles. He slid wide. Race should be over at this point, but... <laughs> as like everything today. I mean... That is crazy. Paul goes to the outside to try to pass the lap car, gets in the marbles, can't make the turn. Dominic goes to the inside, lap car doesn't see him, hits him, turns him sideways, big crash, and look at this. There's your champion. What a day. On the day when Alex Gurney's father, Dan, celebrated winning Le Mans, and then a week later went on to win the Belgian Formula One Grand Prix 40 years ago. And now the Gurney name is at the top once more daytona prototypes the new champion he and john fogarty we'll hear from him when we come back speed's coverage of the rolex sports car series is brought to you by rolex a crown for every achievement by ruby tuesday simple fresh american dining and powered by pontiac and the 260 horsepower solstice gxp We're back to wrap things up from Miller Motorsports Park. Coming up next, it is NASCAR performance. We want to remind you about that. But first, we've got some housekeeping, and we want to hear what our champions have to say because this has been an interesting and enthralling day, Brian. Alex Gurney has stopped his car down at victory lane. The rest of the team still down at the pit box. Stirring drive. The season had been beautiful. I won't call today pretty at all, but the result ends up the same. That contact that you had with Scott Pruitt. Yeah. Did the car hiccup a little bit, or was it all just uh, the nudge from the 01? Well, man, I could write a book about all the things that were happening out there at the end and trying to keep on top of what the point situation was. But, uh, yeah, after the contact that John had, um, my steering was kind of pointed the other direction, so it would turn uh, left really well, but it wouldn't turn right. Um, anyways, they can say what they want about that, uh, that contact, but I, I lost a lot of respect for, for them because that was some... Dirty stuff. I mean, really dirty stuff. Anyways, aside from that, hey, we're the champs. We did it. This team deserves it, and uh, we're stoked. Celebration is going to go on all weekend long in Las Vegas at the banquet. You heard him say the championship is ours. That really is all that matters to them, but it wasn't a pretty one, guys. Let's take a look not only at that incident once again, but the Daytona prototype results because there's some personal bests in there for season 2007. In particular, the race winners, Riley Matthews. Well done to the Samax team of Ryan Dial, Thomas Enger, and Chris Sakaris. They start, they finished the year the way they started. And to Nick Johnson and Colin Brown, well done. And the Southern duo of Lewis and Lux, super stuff to be in the top four. We wind back to some of the guys who experienced a tough day, in particular, Indy 500 winner, Buddy Rice, Darren Law, and David Donahue. They had the pace, but they just had the hiccups. The day wasn't theirs, finishing back in 20th position, and that's not the way they would have liked to have finished the 2007 season. More from the pits. Scott Pruitt, always the consummate professional, and it, it went down to the bitter end. It went down to the last race, but it was not a pretty one today. Scott, from your cockpit, can you give us uh, some insight? 
Cheap shot. Big cheap shot. I mean, he just came in, cleaned me right out the back. Uh, congratulations to Bob, but the drivers there are just no class. I don't know. I mean, it's... And then Grand Am, I mean, I'm coming up on the inside of uh, the 99 over there. We rubbed a little bit, and I get called for, uh, I just think, a call that shouldn't have been made. I mean, he didn't get off. Uh, he, he got a little up offline, but but no no harm, no foul. So disappointing end. I mean, I expected a lot more out of those guys, but, um, you know, I guess uh, stupid people do stupid things. A lot of emotion down here on the part of Scott Pruitt, this whole Chip Ganassi team. It's a shame to see the championship come down and end this way, guys. We go to the points. This is what it looks like at the end of the 2007 season. Two points the margin. That was it. Between Gurney Fogarty, the new champs, over Scott Pruitt and Angelelli. The championship hopes went up in flames, didn't they? Rojas consolidates fourth place. Colin Brown, Darren Law, David Donahue all tied for fifth place. Chris. Well, we saw Andy Lally and R.J. Valentine charge late in this GT championship, but the momentum swings back the other way for Dirk Werner today. Dirk, pretty uh, pretty calm, easy race for you guys. Just kept out of trouble. You get the championship. Oh, it was not so easy <laughs> as it looked. Uh, I mean, there were a lot of cars who had big problems, and uh, we tried to avoid everything we could. Um, we, we cruised around the last two hours, pretty low refs and uh, no risk anymore. And I think that that's really one of the greatest moments in my life. I mean, I have to thank everybody who is involved in this and everybody put such a big uh, work in it. Thanks to everybody. Uh, Werner grabs his championship with 10 podiums and one win. Two years, two championships for Dirk Werner. He and Bryce Miller embrace excellent performance from those boys. And in the end, Yes, the 07 Pontiac did hold on over the two Farn Lowell's Porsches. Well done to the Mazda, the Speed Source boys of Asentato, Haskell, Longy, and Armengol getting fourth over the 57 Stevenson Corvette. Top five to round out the year. That will put a smile on their face. But Brian, I'm sure the boys at Riley Matthews are smiling. Jim Matthews celebrating down here. Ryan hunter Ray, great job for him. But Mark Goosen's in the car at the end. When we talk to you at Montreal, that great finish there. Everybody knew it was only a matter of time before you win. Congratulations. Thank you very much. Um, you know, I can't thank this team good enough. You know, they did, uh, they did an awesome job. Uh, the stops went pretty good. Uh, I mean, perfect race for us. Uh, car was maybe not the best, not the fastest, but, you know, we had it under control at the end. So, you know, all good things I can say about this team. He said he had it under control at the end, guys. It sounded like a lot of other people didn't. Chris? Well, Paul Edwards gets that win in that final lap. Crazy couple corners there, though, Paul. I couldn't believe it. You know, it's like, it just sums it up. I mean, it was just incredible. I, I saw him, and we, I mean, it's been a strong day all day. It's been an awesome year for the whole team the whole year. I mean, it's brand new car, brand new team. I mean, to come through with a victory, you know, it's almost as good as a championship for us right now. Congratulations. Well done to the Pontiac boys from Banner Engineering. The GT Championship points look like this. In the end, it was a 10-point margin. Dirk Werner over Collins and Edwards. Bryce Miller grabbing that fourth spot. And you have to spare a thought for Andy Lally and RJ Valentine in there in fourth over Sylvain Tremblay. Our SunTrust Improve Your Position Award winners for the final time this year in Daytona Prototypes. We congratulate the 11 gaining valuable positions. And Allegra Motorsports there, Carlos Di Caseda and Jean-Francois Dumoulin winning the award for the GT class. Well, that's it. It has happened so fast. That is the 2007 Rolex Sports Car Series. NASCAR performance coming up next. Stay tuned to SpeedTV.com for all the details in the off-season. On behalf of the entire Speed team, thanks for being with us with a fabulous season.